proton formation. So this reaction has a huge positive potential. So that means that the photosynthesis is going to happen. That's also the reason why even after 40, 45 years, people are trying to understand how nature is doing this reaction. Is it possible at one point to split water in a convincing way? There is a Nobel Prize reserved for this one. So that, that it is expected at one point that okay, so Fujishima and Honda would have got the Nobel, will get the Nobel Prize. So the, the gravity of the issue is like this, and the beauty of this technique is such that. So in principle, it should be a feasible one. It should be a driven one. So this should happen. So convincingly, that means that the PEC cells can actually at one point can give out the energy, whatever way you are looking at. Okay, so they let it be glucose, let it be methane, let it be hydrogen. So all these things. But that means now going back to what actually we can do for this one. Okay, now the story is understood. So the same PEC cells have been coined beautifully as artificial photosynthesis. It's fine. But the way to go for in all these things, the first step of the reaction is basically water splitting. If you can achieve water splitting easily, so then you are in a position basically to uh, generate the energy the way we can think of. Now you may say that, sir, what is the possible way in which I can split water? Okay, so as shown in the slide, this is a very simple, this is a strontium titanate catalyst, which is actually kind of, uh, I mean, semiconductor with large band gap. So that is actually shined by the UV light. The way you see that the bubbles are easily forming. But now this reaction appears to be very easy on the previous slide because if you look at now the previous slide, it actually tells a single pot reaction. That means it is a photocatalytic reaction rather than photoelectrochemical reaction. The difference in this case is you are not separating the half cell reactions. If you look at water splitting, water splitting has two reactions. One is a hydrogen evolution, another one is an oxygen evolution. Oxygen evolution should take place at the anodic site. Hydrogen evolution should take place at the cathodic site. If these two are separated, it actually transforms to like a PEC cell. In the presence of the sunlight, if you are driving, if you are carrying out this reaction, if the half cells are separated, then what you have is basically photoelectrochemical cell. But you have like a single pot or round bottom flask in that you have some kind of a powdered catalyst. You have water on that you are shining the light. You see the gases evolving, but gases can be both oxygen and hydrogen, both of them. So that means we cannot separate the reactions. So that is basically a photocatalytic reaction as shown here. So that means this reaction, if I separate the half cells, the way it is shown at the anodic site, water splitting takes place in the presence of the sunlight. So that means you know, when you shine the sunlight with a, on a suitable semiconductor, so there is a valency band and there is a conduction band. These two get separated. Now the electron present in the conduction band will be drawn uh, to the counter electrode or uh, to the cathodic site. So now in between the energy requirement for water splitting is only 1.23 electron volt. This one point that means if you typically look at a conventional PEC cell, it, the, the way it is shown on the right hand side. So if you look at now the as a function of pH, now the evolution potential changes, the, the potential at which the evolution of oxygen and hydrogen take place are going to change. This changes as a function of 59 millivolt per pH unit. That means if I'm carrying out the reaction at zero pH, so the oxygen evolution should take place at 1.23 volt and hydrogen evolution should take place at the zero volt. Whereas when you trans at the zero volt, when you transform this one as a function of a neutral pH or as a function of a basic pH, now under basic pH conditions, now you see that the, the, the uh, I mean hydrogen evolution takes place at minus uh, 0 0.829 volt, whereas now the oxygen evolution should take place at 4.01 volt. That means conventionally, ideally speaking, that I cannot carry out under zero pH conditions. It is not advisable to carry out under 14 pH conditions. In a way, if I can carry out the reaction under neutral pH conditions, okay, so this appears to be advantageous, but let us see whether it actually goes or not. The same thing, whatever I've shown previously, I've transformed this one to some kind of equations to tell you. So that means this is an acidic condition with a pH of close to zero. So that means this is the way it is represented. Uh, in the textbook, whereas when you exactly go to the 14 pH, this is what it happens. Under neutral conditions, this is what it happens. Now you may say that, sir, now I'm convinced, okay, or at least like it is uh, convincing on paper to say that, okay, water splitting reaction has huge potential for doing research. Uh, I I agree that, okay, my statement is very correct in terms of doing research. At the same time, it also has a potential by looking at the thermodynamics, okay, by looking at the energy takes. This reaction should be feasible with the visible light. The only motto people go forward is like, so you visible light has sufficient energy to split water. 
So that means that, but for this, you need to look for various characteristics, various requirements of the materials are there. Materials play an important role. Until one point of time, TaO2 has been blindly used rate. Okay, now with the thrust of new materials or with the discovery of very, very new materials, now the scope has widened. And there is actually, it appears promising that at one point of time, and there is, otherwise there is promise that at one point we can realize this one. So what are all the things that are needed? Okay, so for those who want to carry out research in this direction, let it be photocatalysis or let it be PC cells or let it be artificial photosynthesis. Okay, so I'm going to suggest uh, the following, which I will carry, which I will explain one by one. You need to have a good material with good absorption coefficient. What do you mean by absorption coefficient? If you look at the solar spectrum, solar spectrum actually tells that it has a lambda max at 598 nanometers. That means when I'm putting a semiconductor of close to say, for example, 2.4, 2.5 electron volt. So in principle, this should uh, tap the energy. So, but the energy of 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, up to three electron volt will be utilized. But the energy which is below 2.5 electron volt cannot be utilized if you go with uh, a, a semiconductor of 2.5 electron volt. Then you can also say that, sir, I'm shining, say, for example, 100 watt, which has so many photons. Each, I want to ensure that the number of photons, okay, so utilized should increase. But as you know that these reactions are only surface reactions. That means that, okay, not necessarily that the one gram of the material is really going to be utilized for this purpose. That means you need to increase the absorption cross-section in other words, something called the absorbability of the material has to be increased. That means before that, you need to have an ideal material, which is a suitable band gap material. So then it should have a direct band gap. Okay, so the reason that you, I'm sure like many of you are, all of you are aware, the direct band gap and indirect band gap, or the only difference is a direct band gap material can only emit the photon. Okay, so because if you plot, if you make a plot of the, say for example, momentum versus say for example, energy, you know that the moment of the electron and the hole in both valency and the conduction band, okay, so is the same in the case of direct band gap semiconductor. So that means you should have a direct band gap semiconductor. You should also ensure that the diffusion length of the minority carrier should be as long as possible. Because the majority carriers for an n-type semiconductor is basically an electron, but the minority carriers are the holes. These holes are the ones that are actually uh, reacting with your electrolyte because electrolyte quickly transfers the electron so that the whole transport actually takes place. So for this to happen, the diffusion length of the minority carrier should be as long as possible. The width of the space charge layer must be as long as possible, as large as possible. The photoelectrode should be stable and the thickness of the material should be as large enough to, so that you can absorb everything. And the lattice mismatch and thermal mismatch should not be there. And at the end of the story, the cost should not be very, very high. Then you may ask a question, sir, you have made it uh, very complex. Okay, you said several characteristics. Now let us go one by one. Let us understand. Okay, so please go one by one. And now you tell me that in terms of the, now I will divide them into three categories. You have electrolyte, you have electrodes, which is an anode, which is a cathode. Another one is a cathode. In between, you have an electrolyte. That means if I divide this into three parts, okay, so not bringing the heavy engineering stuff into the picture, if I have only a simple cell, which is a full cell, which is a combination of anodic cathodic cell, okay, anode and a cathode, it's not a half cell reaction, it is a full cell reaction, you also have an electrolyte. How to choose an anodic material? This is the first question. If you look at now, the why do you need a semiconductor? That's actually in the way to answer, okay? So if you look at the metal, metal has no difference between the valency and conduction band. Why do you need a separation between the valency and conduction band? Please understand that the hole and the electron have to be separated enough so that the whole reactivity and the electron reactivity will be optimized in such a way that the electron quickly goes to the cathodic site and hole goes to the hole reacts with the electrolyte. For this to happen, so the metals are not good candidates. Then a large band gap semiconductors or insulators are also not good. So because ultimately with respect to water splitting level, the, the gap is only 1.23, energy requirement is 1.23 volt or 1.23 electron volt, that means that metal is not a good one because there is no separation between the valence and conduction band. At the same time, insulators demand high energy, we cannot do that. To cut short it, okay, so if I look at now the periodic table, the options I have are basically the, the proven examples are basically a metal with a zero oxidation state, 
are a metal with the 10 oxidation state. The, I mean, the D0 and D10 systems are basically the ones which are, I mean, not zero, sorry, not zero oxidation state. It is with the zero configuration with respect to D. The titanium plus four or vanadium plus five or zirconium plus four or niobium plus five, if you look at these things, they are basically with the D0 configuration. Whereas when you come to the extreme right side, you have the zinc oxide and your cadmium okay, so oxide, okay, so these kind of materials. So they are basically like the D10 configurations. So these two are the proven systems in the literature. Then sometimes you are also trying to dope these metals like the non-metals into the metallic network or into the oxide network so that you try to vary the band gap of it. So that means the partially filled D orbitals, there is a problem with respect to the higher recombination. Whereas a material with the D10 or D0 configurations, the main limitation is with respect to the large band gap because the TMO2 band gap is very, very high. That means if you look at the conventional uh, oxides, which are uh, uh, proven oxides, so if you look at now, this is an oxygen evolution level, this is hydrogen evolution level, this is an oxygen evolution level. So now if you look at now the tungsten oxide, okay, so let it be tungsten oxide or let it be iron oxide, this guy, this candidate, iron oxide or tungsten oxide, cannot do the hydrogen evolution. They can only do the oxygen evolution. Whereas now, if you look at now kind of a zinc sulfide or even cadmium sulfide, these kind of materials, they can do both hydrogen evolution and oxygen evolution. That means now to choose a reaction, you need to have 1.23 electron volt, but it is not necessarily that any material with 1.23 electron volt will do the job. How to understand this one? If you look at now, say for example, the hydrogen evolution takes place uh, at the conduction level. So that means the conduction band of the semiconductor should be more negative with respect to the hydrogen evolution level. That is the requirement. At the same time, the oxygen evolution, the valency band of the semiconductor should be more positive with respect to the oxygen evolution level. This is the first requirement I have. That means 1.23 is an ideal requirement, but nothing can happen at 1.23. Even for argument's sake, if it happens at 1.23, you need to have an optimum uh, band position alignment with respect to the semiconductor. The way to understand is the hydrogen evolution level or the conduction band of the semiconductor should be more negative with respect to the hydrogen evolution and the valency band of the semiconductor should be more positive with respect to the oxygen evolution. This is the first part. Then the second part of it is basically that you need to choose the semiconductor like the way it is listed on the left hand side. You see that the, the X which is on the, the, the bottom picture, the X, it can neither do the hydrogen evolution nor oxygen evolution. That means minimum 1.23 is needed. Then the bands should be in such a way that it should be more negative with respect to hydrogen, the more positive with respect to oxygen. That means the second one I am showing here, I am moving the cursor. This can only do the oxygen evolution like your iron oxide. Whereas when you come to a situation like this one here, okay, so it can only do the hydrogen evolution, but it cannot do the oxygen evolution. That means this is also not good. Whereas when you come to say, this is like typical example of some kind of gallium arsenate kind of a material. Whereas when you come to the extreme left, okay, this candidate, this semiconductor can do both the hydrogen evolution and oxygen evolution. That means that, okay, I should choose only this one among all the combinations I have. This is not good, this is not good, this is not good, this is the only candidate I have. Then you may say that, sir, sir, no, I got the point. That means I should choose a minimum band gap of 1.23. I should also ensure that the band alignment should be in such a way that, so the oxygen evolution, uh, the conduction band should be more uh, negative with respect to hydrogen. Uh, evolution and the valency band should be more positive with respect to oxygen evolution. I found a material whose band gap is around the argument sake 1.8 electron volt. Okay, now you tell me that, but still I am not able to see the good uh, uh, reactivity or good hydrogen evolution. What can be the reason? Here the reasons are listed here. Those who remember the Jablonski diagram, okay, so you can easily understand whenever you shine a material or whenever you excite a material okay when the electron is promoted from valency band to the conduction band or in other words jablonski diagram talks about homo to lumo level when an electron is uh, excited when a material is excited when an electron is promoted the reaction takes place the excitation takes place in 10 power minus 15 seconds then the electron present here hole present here hole has to travel to the semiconductor electron has to travel to the external circuit 
to uh, good the, to give the hydrogen evolution but now the electron present here has two options one to get transferred to the, the collecting electrode like your ftvo glass or whatever then it should go that means electron transfer has to take place at the same time this electron there is a possibility of recombination if you look at the time scales of this reaction so the electron transfer is of the order of 10 to the power of minus 3 seconds whereas now the electron recombination with the hole is a very very favorable reaction which is of the order of 10 power minus 9 seconds that means the time scale of this reaction is so fast compared to the electron transfer reaction that means that the electron recombination cannot be prevented this is also our electron combination has a high probability of re I mean recombination this is also the main problem uh, in photovoltaic cells or even pec cells whatever you do somehow you do something to prevent this recombination how do i prevent it i have to quickly withdraw the electron but electron recombination is a very dominant reaction so that means the whole story of the researchers are basically is like how do you prevent this recombination do I put a passive layer or do I quickly withdraw, do I create defect sites or do I increase the plasma absorption because only 10 electrons are present in the excited state. Can I increase the 10 to say for example 1000 so that this is a probability factor some portion at least can go to the counter electrode. So that means now the competing reaction is a more dominant reaction in all these cases. Then you may ask a question, sir, how do I prevent this competing reaction? Because you told me that, okay, the recombination is a more dominant reaction or whether it has more probability or higher probability than the electron transfer. How do I decrease it? Can I, de can I minimize, can I prevent it? No, you cannot prevent it. Then can I minimize it? Yes, there is a scope to minimize it. How do I do that? This you can make use of the nanomaterials. How do I do that is, say for example, I decrease the size or I make the material into nano form. When I make it into the nano form, pure material, when I made it into the nano form, what I did, I created some defects at the same, that means that defects are basically like some kind of trapping sites at the same point. Now, for example, argument sake, you see that this is actually a surface reaction. The hole and the electron generated at some place have to travel to the surface where the electron uh, will be uh, transported, whereas the hole is going to react with your electrolyte. For this to happen, the first thing is the combination of the, or the excitons, the hole and the electron have to reach the surface. Before reaching the surface, they can recombine or after reaching the surface, they can recombine. Before reaching the surface, if they recombine, this is called the volume recombination. If they reach the surface and they recombine before uh, reacting, this is called the uh, surface recombination. When you make the material into nanoform, you are minimizing both of them. How do you do this? Say for example, this is argument say a sphere of a radius 5 centimeters. Now I converted this sphere into a radius of 3 centimeters. That means what? The time it has taken for the electron and the hole to reach the surface is low or lower compared to a radius of 5 centimeters. That means that they traveled for one hour to reach the surface, argument say. Now I minimized it to say 30 centimeters. That means that the volume recombination to some extent can be prevented. Then I create actually material into the nano form. I'm creating some kind of a defects. So when I'm creating the defects, these defects are something like a, a trapping centers. When I, trap, when I have the trapping centers, okay, so in principle, I have actually uh, prevented the recombination of the surface recombination. Then you may say that, sir, you said it very simply, but uh, what is the logical way of understanding it? How do you minimize that? How do you decrease the band gap or how do you minimize? Because decreasing the particle size is actually you are increasing the band gap. I'm sure like all of you know that when you decrease the particle size, your actually separation is going to increase. That means you are converting a semiconductor to an insulator. Then you may ask a question, sir, you told me now that, okay, you don't need to have, you should not, you don't want a TaO2 because which is actually a large band gap semiconductor. If your objective is to have a material with an ideal uh, semiconductor, like ideal band gap, I cannot go to a nanomaterial. Okay, so, but still you have an advantage in going to a nanomaterial, but there is a further way to do this one to prevent this recombination or to decrease the band gap. The way forward to decrease the band gap of TaO2 argument sake are like this one. There are only four possible ways in which you can play with the band gap. The first option is basically by putting a metal doping. 
when you try to put a metal doping metal creates a mid states in between so that means this is the original valence in the conduction band you have like the of ta over 2 so then i tried to put iron doping to this one when i try to dope this one now you see that i created some kind of a mid states in between so that means dopant will form mid states so that means effectively it actually lowers the band gap dopant will act as the trapping centers for electrons and the holes so that the recombination can be prevented this is a metal doping the second possibility is a non metal doping so that means that when you actually dope a non metal what you are doing is you are playing with the molecular orbital picture this is a pure mbo this is mbo diagram of the pure tao2 both the valency and the conduction band are made up of only titanium d band and the oxygen 2p level the moment to try to dope with nitrogen sulfur so this carbon this kind of things you are altering the molecular orbital picture in such a way that now it is not only pure oxygen and the titanium you also have nitrogen molecular uh, atomic orbital coming in the picture as a result this is the original band gap and now this is the decreased band gap this is the second possibility the third possibility is like okay you follow the nature okay so you try to replace okay so you in the nature you see that the for water splitting the sunlight doesn't directly react with water okay so that means the sunlight uh, gets uh, is utilized by some kind of a photo system okay so which actually gets activated it creates electron and hole pair combination kind of a thing so that means now you need to play with the nature okay so or look at the nature the way the green pigment is doing you try to replace the green pigment with a suitable dye so that now the tao2 has a large band gap my objective is to populate the conduction band of tao2 for that what i can do i can actually use the visible light so i use a small band gap okay so the dye is basically a colored material so that it quickly gets excited now the, you see that the conduction or the lumo level of the dye is more negative with respect to the conduction band so that the electron quickly transfers to the conduction band so this is one possibility so that means i can play with this combination with the dye whereas now dyes are so expensive because you know that people got excited when there is a dssc dye sensitized solar cell it was reported by professor gretzel but if you look at now the ruthenium dye okay so even milligrams of the dye you need to put at least like 40 50000 so because it's a ruthenium based and the porphyrin based dye so now you can actually conventionally you can easily play with this one in the laboratory by replacing it with a quantum dot okay so here it is a cds quantum dot and now if you see that the cds quantum dot okay it has a band gap of around 2.5 electron volt now the conduction bands are suitably positioned so that i can use a heterojunction with respect to cds and tao2 here the electron cds is the first one to get excited so that that means now there are only four options as i have listed one play with the metal doping then the play with the non metal doping try to replace with a dye if you dyes are so expensive then engineering okay so materials like quantum dots you can make use of it now the advantage with quantum dot is quantum dot can be made in any size okay so let it be 20 nanometer cds let it be 40 nanometer cds let it be 80 nanometer cds now i am putting like this my hand with the four five different fingers have different dimensions but when i am making use of it okay so for example i put it under the sunlight now each one adapts one particular radiation okay so that now the increasing the absorbity of the material is going to benefit more electron creation in the conduction band so that the effectiveness can be increased okay this is one possibility then coming back to the basic terminologies you have that means now you know that how to play with an anodic material because anodic material is the first part of the reaction where on uh, that okay you are shining the sunlight okay when you shine the light okay so now you are creating an exciton pair that means if the exciton pairs the prevention is uh, uh, i mean the recombination is minimized then you can think that the scope is going to increase tomorrow then these the, there is something called solar to hydrogen conversion especially for solar fuels when you talk about solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency it is represented with respect to say for example this 1.23 the theoretical potential multiplied by the j max that means the current density of the semiconductor whatever you get the current density uh, then you have the power input okay so that means you need to standardize it with respect to say 100 i if those who use the artificial solar lamps they have a normalized power of say for example one sun which is like 100 milliwatt per square centimeter so that means this is a normalized one 
then multiplied by n efficiency this is actually a term which always we think that this is equal to 1 that means that you are always assuming that there is no loss okay so that means whatever you have effectively everything converted to everything so that means there is no loss in this case no, no loss of energy in this case that so that means you sometimes you may not see even this one in the equations but effectively this is how the solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency is represented now this reaction can be done in two possible ways one is basically say for example a photocatalytic mode another one is basically photo electrochemical method so that means in this case okay both hydrogen evolution oxygen evolution are taking place on the same uh, semiconductor but in this case the hydrogen evolution uh, this is oxygen evolution and the hydrogen evolution are clearly separated by using some kind of a redox mediator so the way it is shown here the hole present in the valency band the electron in the conduction band now the electron basically say for example quickly transfers to the external circuit and it actually reaches the counter electrode whereas now the hole which is present here is replenished by the electrolyte which is present here there is a redox electrolyte which is present here so that means this is going to replenish the electrons okay so that quickly the cycle is going to complete this is how it is done this reaction as i said that you can separate the reactions into two half cells which is basically an anodic reaction so that means in all these cases there are mainly four important points you need to worry about it first and foremost you need to create the charge then you need to separate the charge then you need to ensure that the charge transport is very quick so then you need to ensure that the charge transfer that means the the h plus is quickly transferred through the electrolyte to the counter electrode so that means one is an electron transfer another one is a hole transfer okay so then you need to see that okay, the current has to be more and more if the current is more naturally the efficiency is going to be more then the requirements of the photoelectrodes okay to simplify it you need to have an optimal band gap of 1.7 to 2.1 electron volt you don't need tao2 always but there inadvertently people use tao2 uh, because of the very reason that okay so uh, because of the reason um, that whenever you use uh, tao2 uh, people depend on the large band gap but uh, the people uh, use tao2 for the very reason that okay imagine your two hands placing this way okay so when you put your two hands very close to each other okay so that means the distance between them is so small so that the excitons can be quickly recombine argument sake like your ground floor and the ceiling or the floor and the ceiling is a 10 feet high imagine that that is a small band gap semiconductor but whereas okay so in large buildings you have basically it is actually more than 15 feet height so that means that when you have a 15 feet height now the requirement of energy is more because the distance between the ceiling and the 15 feet is higher than the distance between the uh, ceiling and the floor of 10 feet 10 15 this is the difference but the main advantage with it is when you have a 15 feet when you try to throw a ball okay and hit the roof it will take additional time compared to a roof of only 10 feet height that means when you use a large band gap semiconductor the main advantage is like the recombination time is actually so some energy is more okay because the separation between the valence and conduction band is more at the same point of time the separation is also going to be more a small band gap semiconductor probably the recombination is very very fast a large band gap semiconductor the recombination is basically slightly uh, uh, lower on the lower side then the second thing i have already said that the band adjust should be suitably placed then the material should be of the uh, durability yeah, when it should be long lasting that means you see that okay i took more engineering materials recent developments if you look at iron oxide iron oxide cannot do the hydrogen evolution so the same way tungsten oxide the same way bismuth vanadium oxide we cannot do it but if you look at now the another set of materials like gallium arsenide okay so this gallium arsenide typically cannot do the oxygen evolution or even the copper oxide at one point okay so simple cu2 wo that this cannot do the oxygen evolution but cu2o in other words which is actually the best combination of the material you can find in the literature so that means like the playing with the stoichiometry playing with the kind of a material these things are probably going to play a role okay for all these things ideally looking at okay so one would expect that okay when you use actually especially a photo anode and photo cathode you expect that the current density has to be more okay but ideally speaking say at one point of time you start seeing the current okay but at one point it tails out okay so it, you don't see the theoretical um, value whatever you can get so that means you need to ensure that whenever you are playing with a full cell 
you need to depend on the photocathode or you need to depend on the anode so in such a way that the optimal point is something which you are operating so this is what you have to look at the same way like okay you need to increase the absorption cross section there is something called fill factor i'm sure those who are going to talk in solar cells they are going to cover this one the fill factor so you must increase it in such a way that okay so that means light absorption one part has to be increased so that okay you can also increase the i mean the, the fill factor so these are the options then the photo anode has to be typically an n type material okay so that means like your uh, tao2 is typically zinc oxide these are typically like okay so the photo anodic materials they are typically n type materials in this case the majority carriers are the electrons the oxygen evolution takes place at the photo anode so that means so this is a half cell reaction represented whereas when you come to the photo cathode it should be made up of a p type semiconductor the holes are the majority carriers in this case the hydrogen evolution takes place on this surface but the story goes little more complex whenever you put a semiconductor in an electrolyte okay when semiconductor is dipped in an electrolyte the story goes more complicated because we all know that okay especially the we all have studied this with respect to something called a double layer capacitance or something like okay zeta potential this kind of things but the story complexity comes because of this one Uh, if you put a semiconductor okay so the electrolyte okay so the condition of both because the role of the electrolyte is to quickly facilitate the transfer of the hole so that means the quickly the electron transfer has to take place from your semiconductor to the photo anode so that the hole goes on hole moves basically quickly to the other side to the opposite side of the electron flow that means if you look at now the way to understand this is whenever there is a semiconductor the say for example you define the chemical potential of the semiconductor with respect to the fermi level whereas the chemical potential of a liquid electrolyte okay so is uh, explained with respect to the redox potential you look at now say for example this is basically a liquid which is present there and this is basically a semiconductor when you dip it okay you see the before it in contact with the liquid there is a clear separation between the valence and conduction band being an n type material the fermi level is closer to the conduction band but now this is the chemical potential of your redox electrolyte so but now the for the equilibrium to attain okay there has to be something called the band bending when the band bending in the upward direction for an n type material so the alignment is quickly going to take place okay so the same thing is going to happen for even for a p type material so that means when a semiconductor okay, say for example when a, a semiconductor is dipped okay immersed in a redox electrolyte the charge carriers are transferred at the semiconductor electrolyte interface until the equilibrium is attained the way it is shown here this is now the picture where now this is the redox potential of say this is the chemical potential of the uh, liquid okay so the electrolyte and this is before reaching the equilibrium but now you see that there is actually say the, as a result the principle of the band bending takes place the semiconductor with the band with the bent bands okay so it will be more effective compared to the uh, non bent okay for a pc water splitting device the redox couple of interest okay with respect to hydrogen is a p type and uh, say oxygen is basically an n type you see that whenever you see that okay this is with respect to the fermi level alignment for by the, the the when the fermi level alignment is going to take place the difference in the potential is with nothing but your onset potential so that means the 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 i mean we i mean open circuit uh, i mean potential okay so that means this is basically the voc uh, which is going to determine basically whether your semiconductor is a good material or not okay so this is one part so that means when the charge transfer takes place for an n type material the bending is going to be in the upward and the for a p type material the bending is going to be in the downward direction the story is little more complex if you actually look at before reaching the pre equilibrium and after reaching the pre equilibrium and this is for actually semiconductor liquid junction and this is for a buried junction okay so if you actually look at in in any of these cases so under the dark and say for example uh, under the illumination so now the the potential which is developed is basically going to determine basically how effective the the, the is, uh, i mean the electrode combination is so whenever there is some kind of say for example there is some kind of a loss due to some kind of an effects or some surface defects or some kind of things uh, this is the theoretical potential that can be derived by using this kind of a combination but that may go little low especially in the for the practical reasons so that means ideally speaking you are using an n type material here you are using a p type material here to play with this combinations 
then you may say that sir now i understand that okay i need to have an n-type material and a p-type material i need to have a good combination of the electrolyte so i understand all these things but tell me what are all the possible ways to see a good pc pc conversion efficiency uh, it is known for 40 50 years okay the way forward or how do we understand now that the improvements are how do you look for an improvement the improvements can be looked at by looking at the bulk uh, semiconductor or you can play with the semiconductor you can play with the i mean the surface of the semiconductor you can play with the say for example uh, interface phenomena because when you have a semiconductor dipped in an electrolyte the electron transfer or the, <laughs> the the whole transport is something which is going to control the story now so then you also have something like an electrolyte which is also playing a role in all these cases there are mainly three steps which are preventing the solar fuel uh, production or which can be improved to see good solar fuel production, which is the light harvesting capacity of the electrode can be increased. The photo generated electrons have to be separated and they have to be facilitated to transport quickly. Then the catalytic reaction should be facilitated. These things actually can be played. Okay, you can play all these things by the CST efficiency, charge transfers, charge separation and transport efficiency can be increased by some kind of a doping, some kind of a metal plasma, and some kind of a structural control you can do, or you can create a heterojunction, or you can actually play with some kind of a co-catalyst loading. These are the possible ways in which you can do. Let us look at one by one. See, for example, if you look at now the theoretical photo uh, current density, uh, depending on the band gap of the semiconductor calculated, by assuming that 100% incident uh, photon conversion efficiency, is taking place at uh, AM 1.5. That means if you tip, uh, yeah, sorry, if you typically look at here, if everything, everything sun, in the sunlight which is falling on the surface, if there is no loss, no nothing, if then everything is getting converted to close to something called 100% IPC value, so then this is an ideal representation which is going to be like this one. You should see more photo current, okay, because every photon is now. Uh, every photon striking the valency band is actually generating uh, the, the suitable energy of the photon is generating now some kind of a photo electron so that now you should see more photo current okay so generated so then but ideally speaking the losses are going to be there if you typically look at a simple cell like this one there is an incident light but there is something like a reflected one not necessarily that entire light has to penetrate through or the transmit through then the absorption thickness is also once again going to prevent so then this is a transmitter light. So that means the losses you have basically are, in other words, with respect to say something like the reflector light. So in other words, there is a poor, okay, so the possible photo current losses mechanism of a semiconductor. That means that, okay, this has to be very, very thin. It cannot be so large. If it is large, it cannot transmit through. So that means that always there are some losses associated with. That means if you want to look at the bulk semiconductor engineering, the way you can look at it is you can increase the crystallinity, but I'm sure that, okay, so some of you know that, okay, making a single crystal or increasing the crystallinity is not that easy. Always we end up with some kind of a polycrystalline material. So I, I cannot really control the bulk semiconductor engineering. But if you look at now, what I can control is the size and thickness of the semiconductor I can control. So that means the semiconductor film, you can optimize the thickness in such a way that, okay, so you try to get more absorption Okay, so with effective charge uh, diffusion length, okay, so you are minimizing the diffusion length. Okay, so this is one part. If you typically look at the recent reports, okay, so say that, okay, the Cu2O is actually a very good material. Okay, so the Cu2O originally reported, okay, in 2011 with a good efficiency, then switch to basically bismuth vanadium oxide. Okay, so then we can also put, say, for example, Sp2SC3, okay, these kind of combinations, or you can play with Cu2S various combinations. That means you can play with a simple semiconductor, you can play with some kind of a heterojunction, okay, so or you can play with actually some kind of a small band gap semiconductor coupled with a large band gap semiconductor. Then you can easily play with the surface engineering, that means the morphology, okay, you easily in the sense like it relatively is, okay, but I'm sure that those who remember the polyol method of the nanomaterial synthesis, so you always want to get okay morphology control okay so but eventually most of the time unless you do some kind of a precaution you take a precaution you always end up with some kind of a spherical particle this is one thing which one can play one can play with some kind of a nano rod nano belt nano wire nano x okay so 
two people will see it's a gold nano rods versus gold nano particles so spherical nano particle versus cylindrical it show difference because light absorption is also going to be different you see two surface plasma resonance peaks for cylindrical particle whereas a spherical particle simply shows only one surface plasma resonance this is one so you can actually play with this combination we can put a metal doping which people can think okay so that means you metal doping is something which you can play with but the main drawback of this one is metal doping should also uh, may also decrease the pec efficiency okay because due to the changing semiconductor surface properties but ideally speaking this i have already covered so one possible way of decreasing uh, the band gap is basically uh, by doping with a metal metal also create some extra i mean trapping sites okay so are the mid states so that you may also increase uh, metal doping may also affect as shown in this picture okay so the the bismuth vanadium oxide the pure bismuth vanadium oxide shows some current okay but the current enhanced when you put uh, some kind of a molybdenum uh, doping on this one this improvement they have uh, attributed basically to the increased ipc value especially but you see that in all these cases the light which is beyond 500 nanometer goes unutilized the light which is around say for example 400 450 500 nanometers is utilized in that now the increased efficiency increased ipc value is seen whenever you put molybdenum doping so this is one thing which people report you can also go with something called a co catalyst loading this is a very common thing especially in the case of the fuel cells or on in inadvertently people use something like a platinum or gold which is like a co catalyst or even ruthenium as a co catalyst ruthenium oxide is a co catalyst the co catalyst basically are introduced to accelerate okay so accelerating a forward reaction meaning that unwanted reactions it will suppress so it provides active site for the catalytic reactions it actually competes with the uh, i mean it actually uh, removes or uh, some kind of suppresses the competing reaction so that the reaction go forward so it also decreases the over potential this is one advantage the way you use ruthenium okay so in with the platinum in, in fuel cells in pem fuel cells it actually tells that the ruthenium suppresses now the co formation okay so at the same time it actually decreases the over potential uh, uh, for uh, the chosen reaction the main drawbacks are you need to optimize it because you see you are actually playing with some kind of hydrogen evolution versus oxygen evolution so you need to play with the order of activity of the co catalyst for oxygen evolution and hydrogen evolution so you this is you see that the, the metal oxides are going to be a good catalyst basically for say oxygen evolution but whereas the metals or alloys are going to be good for hydrogen evolution always you need to strike a balance between that so this is one part which you can think of so the in the literature there are several but one of the examples i have taken is nickel oxy hydroxide was chosen as the four catalyst for say for example bismuth vanadium oxide okay so here okay so the loading of the co catalyst was shown to increase the current okay so at the same time the photo conversion efficiency okay is also going to increase uh, uh, because uh, of the more light absorption you can put it that way so this is one part one easiest way people can think of is something like you load with uh, plasmonic nanoparticles so when you load a plasmonic nanoparticle you have two advantages the plasmonic nanoparticle increases the light absorption capacity this is one part at the same time now the energy that is tapped with the nanoparticle okay so will be transmitted transferred to the semiconductor so this also enhances now the total composite now it uh, improves the efficiency of the composite that means when a nanoparticle is in contact with a semiconductor there is a, there is also another problem something called a short key barrier is going to create because of metal uh, when you put it on a semiconductor so there is a short key barrier which is going to develop but okay in addition to the but in, in any case like when a nanoparticle is in contact with a semiconductor the surface plasma energy so of the nanoparticle like the gold nanoparticle can be extracted in two possible ways one is basically a radiative decay another one is a non radiative decay so that means that okay so as the plasmonic enhancement there are three main mechanisms which people give for water splitting first part you can think of is the scattering uh, efficiency is going to increase the light tapping uh, enhancement is going to see you can also expect that when the particle size is very very small there is something called the hot electron injection is also going to take place otherwise you can also make use of it the plasma resonance energy transfer that means the pret transfer also you can look at that means the light scattering efficiency normally you see that okay it can enhance the effective optical path length of the semiconductor due to the scattering of the photons uh, back to the semiconductor this leads to the enhanced absorption and generation of the charge carriers 
when the particle size is very very small like typically less than 20 nanometers so there kind of you can expect the hot electron creation is going to take place so that means that okay so if the energy of the hot electrons are larger than the interfacial short key barrier the hot electrons can transfer the energy to the semiconductor okay so that that means the electrons can be quickly transferred to the conduction band once the hot electrons and the holes are separated they can carry out their known reactions. The main advantage with uh, actually a very small band gap of a very energetic particle is that, okay, so if the particle size is so small, there is a possibility that the hot electrons can be created. These hot electrons have sufficient energy to overcome the short K barrier so that the quick electron transfer to the conduction band takes place. So in this context, okay, you can see that there is an improved efficiency reported with respect to the gold nanoparticles. Gold nanoparticle of typically 14 to 15 or till around 10 to 15 nanometers, you see that now the onset potential also decreased at the same point of time. The current improvement is also observed at the same point. Now the hydrogen evolution is also increased. Okay, so with respect to simple uh, bismuth uh, sulfide nanorods, on that you are trying to put the, the gold nanoparticles. So the plasmonic effect has improved light absorption at the same point you have the hot electron injection, which is going to facilitate the quick uh, population in the conduction band. So this is one possibility. So then in addition to that, even the small, I mean, the plasmonic nanoparticles you put, you can actually make use of something like the Pret effect. So that means improved absorption capacity you are going to see. So that means the, of the nanoparticles, so the near field energy and the radiative, uh, uh, the, the radiatively transferred to the semiconductor. So hence facilitate uh, less electron pair, okay, so uh, I mean the, in the semiconductor. So that means that the, what it actually means that is like the quick energy transfer is going to favor, okay, so that means in Pratt process, the surface plasma resonance of the nanoparticles can enhance the electric field intensity on the semiconductor, okay, so and thereby it increases the, I mean, the photon absorption near the surface. That means the light concentration is mainly limited due to the surface plasma lifetime so that it must be smaller than the rate of absorption of the semiconductor. So both effects have, I mean, the, the both the, the SPR effect as well as now the PRET effect or the near field effect is going to uh, promote the uh, charge transfer separation. This was also reported, especially with when you look at the silver, gold, and this kind of nanoparticles, okay, you see that the surface plasma effects you can see. This is a pure tungsten oxide. As you all know that the tungsten oxide cannot do the hydrogen evolution. But the moment to try to put uh, some kind of gold nanoparticles, okay, they are going to confirm that, okay, so is going to improve the current density, uh, say, for example, improve the current density. At the same point, the photon conversion efficiency also increased. So this they have attributed basically to the PRET enhancement, where you see the presence of the nanoparticle. So this, the, 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 the near field effect, whatever it has is this energy can be radiated, this energy can be quickly transferred to the semiconductor so that now the improvement is actually seen. The heterojunctions are very common things which people think of. The heterojunction, you can a small band gap combined with a large band gap. Okay, this is what I mean by heterojunction. So this has an increased, this has a benefit that okay, it increases the efficiency of the electron hole separation. In addition to that, if you have, say, for example, TaO2, you are shining by using a CDS TaO2, you are using it. CDS has its own absorption capacity. So on that you are putting, say, for example, uh, BA2S3 argument sake, okay, so BA2S3 CDS combination. CDS can absorb at 2.5 electron volt. Bismuth, the BA2S3 can actually absorb around 1.5 electron volt. So that means now we have increased the light absorption or capacity of the semiconductor. So this is one advantage. The increase in the lifetime and the interfacial charge transfer, okay, so the, the rate of the photo, uh, these, these things play a role. Heterojunction has a staggered band alignment and creates built-in potential, which facilitates the charge transfer. This also broadens the light absorption capacity, especially when you look at here, the way it is shown here, bismuth sulfide and the tungsten oxide. The tungsten oxide, okay, so the moment you try to put with, say, for example, a bismuth sulfide, now you see that, okay, so the quick improvement in the current was observed. The way it is represented in this case is the bismuth sulfide has a, a typical band gap of 1.35 electron volt. You know that 1.35 is basically NIR region, which uh, TaO2 definitely cannot use, CDS cannot do. So that means that part of the light is also utilized now, so that the, now the extra electrons are present in the conduction band of a tungsten oxide. So because you see that tungsten oxide is around 2.7, visible light is sufficient for this. 
But in addition to that, the IR light, which is NIR region, is getting tapped by this BI2S3 so that you have visible plus NIR, the electrons present here as a result of now the energy of the NIR region was tapped by the BI2S3. At the same point, the visible light that was actually utilized by the tungsten oxide so that the more electrons and the band alignment is such that you now the tungsten uh, uh, bismuth sulfide conduction band is suitably placed so that the quick electron transfer is going to take place to the, uh, I mean, like the tungsten oxide. This is one possibility people can think of. Then electrolyte also plays a role, which I've been telling that because you have anode, you have a cathode, and you also have an electrolyte. Electrolyte also plays a role. Now you look at here, they have used something like a borate electrolyte because this is kind of a whole trapping material. So that the hole should also be surviving, okay? It should also survive, okay? So because the hole and electron, they normally travel, they have to travel in the opposite direction because electron travels to the external circuit, but hole travels to uh, the, the electrolyte. So now the, the borate electrolyte, basically they used it to, uh, I mean, the, the prevent or to use the combination of, uh, uh, to, to make sure that, okay, so the hole is going to sustain uh, for some time. So this is one part which people think. The electrolyte and electrode interface, I already said that electrolyte is another important. A slight change in the electrolyte conditions may also uh, see that most of the cases we are talking about the proton transfer. Uh, this is one part, okay, which you, your electrolyte should be a good uh, a proton transporting material in most of the cases. It has a more favorable proton transfer. It should have more favorable proton transfer. Okay, this is one part. Then ideally speaking, okay, so uh, I mean, uh, ideally speaking that, okay, so at one point of, see, these are the known uh, uh, reported the highest efficiency. So with respect to some uh, materials, these are basically done by the leading, uh, there are very, very big players in this, uh, in this game. Okay. Especially like NREL, okay, so the JCAP, okay, so the so Institute of uh, say the Sciences, okay, so JCAP, all these guys, okay, these are the intercontinental or in other words, inter uh, various countries participating in this one. Especially like uh, you look at now the efficiencies reported, this is the theoretical efficiency versus this is the realized efficiency. So now when you actually look at that, there is a difference between the theoretical as well as the realized efficiency. These efficiencies can be improved, brought to the theoretical level by suitably playing with the three combinations. You need to know how to understand the electrode point of view. You need to understand the electrolyte point of view. You need to now understand the band positioning point of view. So these, I mean, you can put in several factors, but broadly anode, cathode, and the electrolyte and the band level alignment in all these cases. When you achieve this one, so you can actually get a tandem cell wherein one part of the semiconductor basically works like an N-type. Okay, this is a P-type, it is separated by an electrolyte. Now you can realize that when you shine an N-type material with uh, say, for example, sunlight, then you can actually see that the oxygen evolution and the hydrogen evolution probably taking place. This is a conceptual representation I took from the literature. So I think there is actually a possibility. Okay, so that, okay, uh, improvements are there. Improvements are reported, but still there is a scope that, okay, this gap between this and this can be actually minimized. Okay, the theoretical efficiency is like, for example, 25% versus 19%, which was actually reported on. These things actually can be made sure tomorrow by suitably playing with these combinations. So that's all I wanted to say, like, okay, I'll be happy to take up any questions that you may have. I try to, for the past one and a half hour, I try to impress all of you that though this is actually an age old reaction, which is not commercialized for various reasons. We know that the sunlight has the definite potential to split water, but we could not realize it because we don't know how to get a suitable material, how to make a material. Now, I'm happy that this course is totally dedicated. This FTP is dedicated to the material development. Okay, tomorrow, if you like at the end of the story, we, some of you take it forward and actually uh, do this one so that, okay, so you see that you bring it to a reality. Okay, with this, I, I thank and I'm open to take up any questions. Okay, uh, I'm actually uh, op uh, uh, over to the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful session. I have a question. Our first question is, how can we confirm whether doping of nanoparticle semiconductor, example TiO2, has occurred or not? Yes, when you dope the material, see, when you are doped, do you are actually trying to... In place of... Uh, one, one second, sir. 
Shani, you are saying you mute yourself? Yes, sir. Uh, so, so please go can I answer? Okay. Yeah, so please. when you say doping, that means the doping has to say when you look at a semiconductor, like argument say TAO2. In TAO2, there are two places for doping. One is basically TI can be replaced with another metal. This is one possibility. Or oxide, oxygen can be replaced with another uh, anion. That means there is a cation doping, there is an anion doping. When you do these things, okay, so it should reflect in the absorption. You it should show a reflection, it should show a change in the UV visible. It can also show the signature peaks in your XPS. So that means the, the band gap, which is now previously made up of only the pure titanium and oxygen, now is going to be shifted because now you have in place of titanium, you have say argument sake, you have put say uh, vanadium, vanadium plus five. Titanium plus four and vanadium plus five, the moment you try to dope it, okay, so that means now the presence of vanadium will show a signature band. Vanadium versus oxygen, there is a charge transfer band. It should, that means there should be a band. Lambda max since it has to be shifted. This is the first part. UV visible clearly confirms that, okay, there will be a shift in the lambda max. The, if you want more sophisticated understanding, you can go with XPS, okay, so it actually confirms to what extent the metal is replaced by another metal. Then the, the same way you can also go for anion doping. People easily go with carbon doping, nitrogen doping, sulfur doping, these kind of things. When you do this one, the band gap has to quickly change. Okay, so the band gap change, lambda max change, okay, will be confirmed by a suitable technique. So that actually confirms that you have doped it or not. Whether there is a doping or it is in a bulk oxide form, say for example, iron oxide, iron doping in place of titanium or simple iron oxide deposition on titanium dioxide, they both will be different. So this charge transfer band, okay, when you actually dope will confirm whether like you have actual doping. Instead of that one, you see a bulk band. Instead of one band, you see two bands simply in UV visible. That tells that oh, iron oxide is not doped. Iron is not doped, but iron oxide has formed. That means pure TaO2 argument sake. Okay, I tell this to my student. Pure TaO2 is a colorless material. When you dope, when actual doping takes place, it should remain as colorless. When it takes up a color, that means that there is a bulk oxide which has formed. Okay, that's as simple as this. Sir, our next question is, is there any polymer-based PECs? Yeah, yeah. Why, well, see, uh, if you, the way you look at here, polymer electrolyte, okay, so the electrolyte is something which is going to play a role. The electrolyte like nephion, if you look at here, this is also kind of a polymer. This is a proton conducting polymer. So the same thing also being used, okay, say when it comes to the electrolyte, okay, I have only tried to, because it's actually a one and a half hour lecture, I try to tell what are the different components. The way I stress term the electrode part, okay, so you also have an electrolyte. Electrolyte can be a proton conducting with more proton conducting or some kind of thing, or say it is a good whole scavenger. So this is one part, okay, so these things are also possible. Yes, to answer your question in a simple way yes uh, the the proton the electrolyte which is made up by polymer electrolyte also has a significant role in this our next question is using this pec cells containing tio2 na nanoparticles the suzuki home coupling reaction rate goes on increases or not? I, I i don't know i cannot answer this question in a direct way but my answer See, first of all, when I want to go with the TaO2, TaO2 cannot do any Suzuki coupling for the known reasons. Because the Suzuki coupling, you need to have a metal where there has to be an oxidative addition, reductive elimination has to be there. I can take your question this way. When the TaO2 was loaded with iron, okay, so our gold arguments, like or even palladium, as you know, conventionally palladium is a Suzuki catalyst. So you can expect this, but my, my objective is not to do an organic coupling reaction, CC coupling reaction in this case. If the objective is to do the water splitting, make use of it, okay, so that you can do. Our electrosynthesis is one part which people are also interested in the recent past, okay, where the organic material can be effective. CC coupling, you can also make use of it instead of a temperature effect. You can do as a potential effect. Yeah, at that point, okay, the palladium loaded TaO2 definitely can do your Suzuki coupling reaction. Sir, what is the difference between doped nanomaterials and plasma nanoparticles? Yes, the doped material is basically you are replacing like you have titanium oxygen, titanium oxygen, this is a network you have it. So you have 10 titaniums and 10 oxygens argument or 20 oxygens for argument's sake in a unit cell. One of the titanium metal or metallic, one of the titanium atom is now replaced with say for example uh, vanadium. 
then you can say it is called doping but whereas you have titanium like your hand okay your five fingers in that one finger you try to replace with another argument say like i am saying it so another finger okay so that is basically the doping whereas you have a hand on your finger you are trying to put some kind of a water drop okay which is a small drop so that drop size is very very small so this is basically like the plasmonic metal nanoparticle which you have loaded this is called loading okay so these two are different okay so but please understand in tao2 titanium is present in the plus 4 oxidation state titanium plus 4 you cannot dope a gold zero there okay so understand okay so there has to be a charge balance for doping also but metallic nanoparticle can be loaded on tao2 surface so the loading is basically on the surface doping is basically it's an interstitial site okay replacing one site with another metal okay titanium is actually replaced with say iron plus 2 titanium plus 4 is replaced with iron plus 3 yeah this is called doping but as where is iron metallic iron nanoparticle of 10 nanometers you have put it on tao2 this is basically called loading <laughs> Sir, among the anatides, rutile, and brucaid forms of TiO2, which one is better? People say that anatides is better, but I think there are also sufficient reports for rutile also. But the crystallographic arrangement is different, and brucaid is not known to be photoactive. But widely, if you look at literature, if you Google it, it actually says that anatides TiO2 is a photoactive material. So, but there are reports that even rutile is also an active material. But even if you look at your degusa, which is like a commercial, uh, which is also a combination of anatase and rutile. Okay, so you get a nearly seventy-five percent anatase kind of combination. Thank you, sir, for uh, answering all the queries. I once again thank you for de delivering a wonderful session to all our participants. so i once again thank this this and i will be happy that all of you please pay attention because i have not covered the synthesis part okay so uh, i i wish that okay this uh, this whole fdp is going to cover all the aspects of nanomaterial so that tomorrow if somebody wants to start their work this will be useful uh, uh, i thank that thank the organizers and i wish that the deliberations will be successful thank you very much Now I request Viru sir to present me as a presenter to share my screen uh, to introduce our next speaker. अंदर म्यूट सुनारायण सर
So there is no response from Shini Alavala. Sir, I am done with my introduction part now. I request you to make Surinarayana sir presenter. Okay. Shani Alavala, have you introduced uh, sir ma'am? Yes sir, I have. Uh, haven't I? Like, didn't you find the screen of mine so far? I'm not sure. Uh, maybe I think I didn't see because you know always you are in mute mode. Even though we are asking you, but uh, we didn't get any response from you. Uh, if it is doesn't, yeah. Sir Nagar, I think you can share your uh, presentation, sir. Okay, fine. Yeah. Could you see my presentation? Yes, you make it to your full screen, sir. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's visible, sir. I think your eyes also good. Okay. Shiva, you can mute everyone except the presenter. Okay, sir. Okay, shall I start? Yes, Please start, sir. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, this is uh, Dr. Surya Narayana Jamala Madaka. So, I am from Department of Physics, Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad. Uh, for the next one and a half hour, I am going to convince you or I am going to discuss about uh, some of uh, the memory technologies that we have been using uh, in our present life and also the research work that we have been carrying out in our laboratory. So the title of uh, today's talk would be Current and Future Memory Technologies. Okay, so briefly like uh, this is our laboratory, Magnetic Materials and uh, Device Physics Laboratory. Like uh, we work on uh, metal spintronics, magnetic materials for energy and devices, the mesoscopic physics, and in particular, the research areas are something like uh, fundamental magnetic nanoparticles and then the magnetic thin films or uh, nano devices, magnetostick to sensors, non volatile memories, uh, and solar cells, and magnetic nanoparticles for biomedical applications, biosensors, and uh, ultrasonic transducers. 
so we also use uh, some chemical molecules to make uh, the molecular junctions like uh, which we would like to develop the molecular spintronics and biosensing based upon the cantilever based sensing like we essentially put biomolecules on top of the cantilevers and try to see the resonant frequency how it would change like as you increase the mass of the material and apart from that uh, the rram the resistive random access memory which is basically a non volatile memory we develop these devices in our laboratory and uh, study for uh, resistance switching characteristics and also for uh, biosensing and uh, neuromorphic computing so the another topic is uh, the uh, mechanically controlled break junction devices through which we basically uh, study the quantum mechanical properties something like uh, conductance quantization and then the tunneling quantum mechanical tunneling so all these phenomena so we try to measure using uh, this mechanically controlled break junction devices so this is are uh, my students like who have been working uh, uh, extensively on these topics okay with this brief introduction uh, um, i would like to go to uh, the outline of the talk so the outline of the talk is basically uh, initially i would like to discuss about uh, the current memory technologies then uh, future memory technologies then nanostructure growth methods and then memories based on rram and their remote control like how one can control in a remote way the resistive random access memories and future work essentially what i am going to discuss is basically like uh, i'll brief you about different memory technologies that exist in real life and also the future memory technologies then um, i will try to discuss briefly about uh, some important uh, uh, methodologies or some important methods to prepare nanostructures like uh, the sputtering technique and then uh, the pulse laser deposition then uh, electron beam lithography so after that uh, um, i would like to discuss about uh, some of the work that we have done at our laboratory okay if you see this picture like uh, initial in the initial days like uh, if you want to store 1 mb of data we we had to use uh, um, a memory chip or um, a memory space of uh, a big room okay uh, the nano technology made it available for us to have the 1 terabit or 1 1 giga 1 terabit memory in very small uh, pen drives or in very small chips okay so this is advantage of uh, the nano technology like uh, further like even so much of research is going on in this direction to uh, make it available the more amount of data in the small area okay so that is the beauty of uh, the nano technology for instance uh, if we consider a computer system like we have uh, input or output devices we have input or output devices then um, the data will be fed to the central processing unit and then one can also get the data as uh, from the output devices like from the monitor okay so in the central processing unit like the main elements are the memory elements like which does all logical operations like we have internal memory uh, primary memory and secondary memory so this primary memory and secondary memory are the one which does all the logical operations and try to perform all the operations that will be fed by the keyboards and all and the resultant output will come to output devices okay now what we need to understand is that what are these uh, internal memories or the, what are the memories that are available in this central processing unit how they will work okay for instance if you consider the storage the storage of anything like uh, we have a primary memory like rom the read only memory so it is basically a non volatile memory and cannot be electronically modified so at any circumstances you cannot modify uh, this memory rom like basically if you want to install any software which you don't want to change forever the rom it will be uh, installed okay if you take ram the random access memory it is basically you can consider it as uh, waiting room or holds instructions for processing the data so the capacity will be in gb like uh, you can have 2 gb 3 gb and 4 gb or the speed of this ram Uh, can be nanoseconds okay it can be read and change in any order like if you want to change the memory in the ram you can change electronically so that can be done in, using the rom however in ram in rom the read only memory you cannot change the memory and it is basically a non volatile memory 
we also have the secondary memory the secondary memory like uh, uh, it is basically non volatile and it is a permanent memory okay so it is used to store the data not in active use like uh, we normally don't use uh, uh, this data for the logical operations like uh, so that's why like we can call it as uh, stored data and not in active use and it is slower than the primary storage like uh, primary storage means like uh, like in rom and ram like uh, the performance of uh, the secondary memory is very little bit slow and we can store more information like uh, if you take external hard disk like uh, we can store more information in the external hard disk okay the secondary memory can be of two types like uh, magnetic storage the storage is based upon the magnetic materials the stores data by magnetizing the microscopic particles by orienting the uh, magnetic moment within the material you can store the information whether it is zero or one like for instance if the magnetic moment is up you can call it as one if it is down you can call it as zero okay this magnetic storage can be of different types like we have a floppy disk like which will have uh, the dimension of uh, three and a half inch and two head two hd it means that on both on both sides you can store the information and it will have the maximum moment of 1.4 mb like we don't see nowadays this floppy disk like we do see pen drives and other things like i'm going to come to that point like uh, and apart from that apart from floppy disk we also have the hard disk the speed based upon the rpm the revolution per minute and then the large capacity large amount of data can be stored and it uses the file allocation table to store or to make the sectors and tracks and then um, apart from this uh, floppy disk hard disk we also have tape okay so the second secondary medium is the secondary storage is uh, optical storage and it will have the variety of uh, dimensions like varying from um, three and a half to 14 inch and in common one would use uh, four three by four uh, dimension um, optical storage medium the data writing will be done by the laser light and then um, the cd the compact compact disc which will have the maximum size of 1 mb and we would also have dvd digital video disc up to gigabits like up the order of 15 to 16 gigabits information one can store in the optical storage so from this slide the summary of this slide is basically we have the secondary memory devices memory storage like uh, magnetic storage uh, magnetic storage and uh, optical storage in both the things we can uh, store the information and most often now uh, these things are replaced these dvds are replaced with uh, um, pen drives essentially the random access memory is a form of uh, computer data storage that stores data uh, and machine code currently being used okay in order to read or write it takes equal amount of time irrespective of data collection okay so it doesn't like uh, random access memory to read and write the information it takes equal amount of time whereas direct access like hard disk like cd drives and dvd drives the time required to read and write the data it depends upon the physical location due to the mechanical limitations such as uh, media rotation speeds like uh, for instance if uh, your hard disk is located at uh, large distances like it takes a lot a lot amount of time um, Lot of lot, lot of time. Okay, depending upon the location of uh, your device, it takes time to perform. What are the current memory technologies? Like uh, I can I can classify uh, now. I can classify my current memory technologies as uh, semiconducting memory. You can classify as uh, the volatile memory and a non-volatile memory. So in the volatile memory, we have SRAM, the static random access memory. And we also have the dynamic random access memory. So in a short while, I'm going to discuss about uh, what is the static random access memory and what is uh, the dynamic random access memory. Apart from that, we also have the non-volatile memory like uh, flash memory, okay? As RAM, it is very fast and low density and large cell size. And DRAM, it is volatile and required standby power. And flash memory, it's uh, limited write endurance, low write speeds, okay? Nowadays, we are using a NAND type of uh, flash memory. Memory categories, further you can classify as uh, RAM, ROM, the random access memory, and read-only memory. 
the random access memory, we have the volatile random access memory and non volatile random access memory. The volatile random access memory, we have SRAM and DRAM. And in the non volatile memory, random access memory, um, FVRAM, ferroelectric random access memory, magnetic random access memory, nano dot memories, phase change random access memory, and molecular and carbon nanotube random access memory. And in the same way, like we also have in the ROM, reprogrammable ROM and uh, once programmable ROM, EP ROM, uh, electronically programmable random access memory, electronically erasable programmable random access memory, and flash memories. Like uh, we also have the mask based ROM and uh, programmable random access memory. So there are various kinds of uh, the primary storages, like we have RAM, ROM. So depending on the requirement, you can use, you can choose any of these things and then use like uh, the one which I have shown here. They are basically the futuristic memories, which are being the so much of research is uh, being carried out uh, on these memories. Right now, we are using SRAM and DRAM in our computer systems. For instance, if you consider an SRAM, the static random access memory, like uh, this is uh, the internal structure of uh, the static random access memory. So it consists of total six transistors and four are cross coupled inverters to store the data. So one, two, three, four, these four, these four transistors we can uh, use to store the information and two transistors will be used uh, to access and control the cell during uh, read and write operations. These are the two transistors and access time of uh, SRAM, the static random access memory for writing and uh, erasing purpose is of the order of 0 0.3 nanoseconds. Like one can write the information in 0 0.3 nanoseconds, one can erase the information in uh, 0 0.3 nanoseconds. The static random access memory have been used as a cache memory. Cache memory means like it's basically kind of mediator. So since the operational speeds of this uh, static random access memory will be very high, uh, we can use as a mediator, okay? Um, and it does not have the leakage issues, so does need not be refreshed like uh, DRAM. Like uh, as I would discuss in a short while, the DRAM will have the leakage currents as a result, like every time you have to refresh the DRAM, whereas uh, the static random access memory, we will not have any leakage currents. As a result, you need not refresh the static random access memory. Now, if you consider a dynamic random access memory, the dynamic random access memory consists of, it is very simple structure. The static random access memory, it is a little complicated, like you would have total of uh, uh, six transistors, whereas in the dynamic random access memory, you would essentially have uh, one transistor and one capacitor, okay? There are only two, one transistor and one capacitor. The stores um, each bit in mass capacitor, mass capacitor, thus the charge state of, uh, charge state of this capacitor can be read as one and discharge the state can be seen as a zero bit. So in this way, like by charging and discharging the capacitor, you can read the information as a one or zero. So the refreshing is mandatory as the capacitor discharges over the time. As we know that the capacitor discharges, um, so we have to refresh this dynamic random access memory. So it is dynamic because the continuous leakage of current, the current will be leaked continuously from the capacitor. As a result, we call this memory as the dynamic random access memory. There are some advantages as well as disadvantages for this dynamic random access memory. Like if you consider the uh, advantages, like uh, it is simple structure in comparison with uh, static random access memory and can be accommodated more density. So since it occupies very less space, you can store more information in the dynamic random access memory. So some of the disadvantages are like we have to use uh, uh, high power and high power, and it is also a volatile nature. It is a volatile nature. Of course, there are some advantages and disadvantages. At some point of time, you have to compromise. Okay. So based on the compromise, this is the best uh, device that one can use for the computing systems. Like uh, dynamic random access memory can be used. We also have the flash memory. The flash memory. It uses the CMOS technology and uh, electronically erasable programmable random read only memory to retain the data after the power is switched off. Like it is basically, uh, it, it, it's having the structure similar to the MOSFET, MOSFET structure, the metal oxide, uh, uh, metal, metal oxide uh, um, fair, uh, field effect transistor, 
So the difference between a flash memory and a MOSFET is basically um, this floating gate. This floating gate, as I mentioned, as I am showing here, this is a floating gate. So, so in the floating gate, we store the information. So, however, this floating gate will be electronically insulated, electronically insulated in the sense that uh, the top there will be a dielectric layer, bottom there will be a tunnel oxide oxide layer. So, by depositing a tunnel oxide layer and dielectric layer on the top and bottom of the floating gate, you can actually electronically insulate the entire floating gate from the actual device. Okay. So now the architecture is similar to uh, electronically insulated architecture is similar to the MOSFET. So the writing of uh, uh, the flash memory will be done by applying by applying a potential difference between the source and drain and also apply a positive voltage to the control gate. So what will happen is that some electrons will try to tunnel through this tunnel oxide to the floating gate. So whomever, like whichever electrons tunnels through this so tunnel oxide will be trapped in this floating gate region. As a result, the information will be writing, information will be written, okay? So essentially apply the potential difference between the source and drain, apply a positive voltage on the control gate, then some electrons will try to tunnel to the floating gate, okay? So once the electrons are tunneled, they will be trapped. So this trapping, will leads to the writing of the information in the uh, flash memory. So now for arranging, apply a positive bias to the substrate and then grounding the control gate. Apply a positive bias to the substrate and then grounding the control gate. In this way, like one can also erase, like uh, the schematic picture of uh, the writing and erasing of uh, the information is shown in the bottom. Like uh, this is uh, uh, the schematic picture for the writing apply a positive bias and then apply the electric field so that electrons will tunnel through the tunnel oxide, the information will be stored. Whereas uh, in uh, erasing, apply a positive bias to the gate, a positive bias to the substrate, then ground the control gate. In this way, one can erase the information, okay? This is how a flash memory works. Flash memory works so like right now, in the computing systems, most of the time we use a static random access memory, dynamic random access memory, and flash memories, the NAND type flash memories we are using uh, in the pen drive. This is the actual mechanism, uh, how to write and or erasing the information from that. Okay, the memory hierarchy in the computers, like uh, um, if you like, uh, like it depends upon the amount of uh, information that you store or uh, the operational speed. Like for instance, you have SRAM, DRAM and a flash memory. The SRAM is uh, very fast and it is volatile and very low density. The density of information that you can store is very low. Whereas in DRAM, it is basically the main memory and it is fast, volatile, and it is also having the low density. The flash memory, uh, it is slow, non-volatile and high density. As I mentioned, like we have to compromise at some point of time. So these are the best uh, devices uh, that are available in the market at present. Uh, to do some logical operations in the computers. As far as the operational speed is concerned, like SRAM is very fast. As far as the storage density is concerned, like um, it, it goes from static SRAM to DRAM to the flash memory. Okay. Now the question is, uh, what a high-end computing and feature memory technologies demand? It demands uh, high density and at low powers and um, um, the information, uh, must, like it must do the logical operations with high speeds. These are the uh, three important things that uh, a computing and future memory technologies demand. Like for instance, if you consider the flash memories, they have reached their bottleneck in scaling. Like as, as the present memory technologies are based on the charge, these devices may face serious challenges when the dimensions are below 10 nanometers due to the leakage current of uh, the stored charge. So they uh, obviously like uh, uh, when you when you thin your material as small as possible, less than 10 nanometers, what will happen is due to the leakage currents, leakage currents, uh, the information will be lost. Okay. So we have to solve this kind of problem in future. That is why like uh, we have to develop the more and more memory technologies for the future. Okay.
Now, um, based on the drawbacks that exist for the current memory technologies, we have to develop future memory technologies, future memory technologies. So, until now, we discussed about uh, the volatile memory like uh, SRAM, DRAM, and in the non volatile memory, like we have uh, discussed about uh, the flash memory. Like as I discussed, like there are some drawbacks for SRAM, DRAM, and flash memories. Like we have to develop new memories, like emerging non volatile memories, emerging non volatile memories, like uh, the FE RAM, the ferroelectric random access memory, the magnetic random access memory the phase change random access memory, spin transfer torque random access memory, and then resist to random access memory and rest track random access memory. So much of uh, uh, research is being put forward uh, in developing uh, these kind of devices. Already the MRAM technology is being used in our computers at, uh, um, by some companies. Like these are the future memories, FERAM, PCM, uh, MRAM, and RRAM. Okay. Now, uh, if you consider a ferroelectric random access memory, ferroelectric random access memory, we will use uh, the ferroelectric properties of a material kind of uh, the lead zirconium titanium titanate. Okay, so ferroelectric material will be sand sandwiched between uh, two electrodes by applying uh, the potential difference across the electrodes. You can actually change the polarization state of uh, uh, polarization state of ferroelectric material. As a result, the more and more information can be stored. And you can also uh, track the information that you have stored by changing the intensity of uh, the electric field. Okay, and also like it, it is also very fast, uh, fast read access. The low operational voltage you don't have to apply very high, high powers. The more energy efficient than flash memory. Okay, the structure of FERAM is similar to that of DRAM. This is a kind of uh, uh, structure that one would use for a ferroelectric random access memory. Now, if you consider a phase change memory, the phase change memory, like uh, this phase change memory will work based upon uh, uh, whether the material is crystalline material or amorphous material, amorphous material. So initially what you would do is like, um, uh, you would be in the amorphous state or crystalline state, but uh, what you would do is initially, if you consider the, if your material is in amorphous state, um, the information will be read as zero. If it is in crystalline state, the information will be read as one. Okay. So now, for instance, initially you are at this position, your device is uh, uh, showing very high electrical resistance. That means uh, the information will be read as zero. And then by applying, by applying a voltage pulse, voltage pulse, basically what you are doing is by applying a high voltage pulse, you are essentially melting your sample, melting your sample, and then um, you'll go to the crystalline state. Okay, so the erasing of uh, the information will be done again by melting. The crystallization and melting, it is basically a closed cycle. So you would actually toggle between the crystalline phase and amorphous phase, which actually gives the information of uh, one and zero. Okay, so from the crystalline phase, you will melt the sample and you will attain the liquid phase. And again, you will get uh, amorphous state. Then again, uh, apply the pulse you'll go to the crystalline state. It's basically a closed cycle through which you can read as well as write the information in the um, materials, in the materials, in the phase change memories by applying the potential, uh, by applying the voltage pulses. Okay, we also have the magnetic random access memory technology, like uh, in the magnetic random access memory technologies, we basically use the magnetic tunnel junctions tunnel junctions or spin valve structures. So like you will have two ferromagnetic layers which are separated by a non-magnetic metal or oxide layer. And then um, basically like you use a non-oxide uh, layer between two ferromagnetic layers through which uh, the electrons will tunnel from the bottom layer to the top layer, okay? These magnetic random access memories are also non-volatile and uh, one can store more information, high density, high speed, and infinite endurance. The endurance of uh, this MRAM technology is very huge. So the reading of uh, the information will be done. The cells are read by the sensing the resistance to determine if the state is high or low. Like essentially you would use, like uh, you will measure the resistance based upon the resistance of the device. If it is high, if you can read it as zero. If it is low, you can read it as one. 
and then writing of the information will be done by the magnetic field generated from the current flowing through the bit and ward lines. Like you can actually uh, send current through this bit or ward lines. So this current actually generates the magnetic field and this magnetic field is sufficient to uh, orient the magnetic movement direction, whether uh, to up direction or down direction. So essentially like uh, uh, by changing the orientation of the magnetic movement, the device will be read as one or zero. Suppose if uh, magnetic movements are both are in parallel direction, um, you can you can read as zero. If both are in anti-parallel direction, you can read it as one because the device will be in very high resistance state. This is this is the structure of uh, the MRAM technology. So we also have the racetrack memory, which is basically the futuristic uh, memory technology. So in this futuristic memory technology, like uh, you would essentially use uh, the ferromagnetic nanowires. So as you know that uh, in the ferromagnetic materials, there will be domains and domain walls. Uh, we use the concept of uh, the domains and domain walls over here. So, so in, in a ferromagnetic nanowire, so whatever uh, the blue or red that you are seeing, the moving parts, they are basically the domain walls. So you would essentially use a spin polarized current to move the domain walls, to move the domain walls using a phenomenon called a spin transfer torque phenomena. So basically what happens is uh, there will be momentum transfer between uh, the spins of spin polarized current and the magnetic moments that exist in the domain walls. Okay. As a result, there will be momentum transfer. As a result of the momentum transfer, uh, the information will be moved uh, throughout uh, the ferromagnetic nanowire. So the information will be read by measuring uh, by measuring the resistance using the uh, tunnel magneto resistance device TMR tunnel magneto resistance device, or you can also use GMR the joint magneto resistance device. So the the device structure will be something like this: like uh, all the magnetic nanowires will be kept vertically, so that the more amount of information will be stored. For instance, if we consider uh, a ferromagnetic nanowire in the horizontal direction, it occupies more space. Instead, if you keep in the vertical direction, if you keep in the vertical direction, one can store, uh, one can have more, more number of uh, ferromagnetic nanowires and more amount of information will be stored. So this is a kind of uh, chip one can imagine. So this is the kind of uh, the futuristic memory, like this racetrack memory, the futuristic memory, so much of uh, effort is being put uh, to develop this racetrack memory because there are a lot of advantages with this racetrack memory like uh, you can also uh, enhance the storing capacity like uh, right now um, storing capacity the limitations what are the limitations of uh, current memory technologies so there are two factors limiting uh, continued scaling of cmos the minimum dimension that we can fabricate it like uh, as i mentioned like uh, the minimum dimension that can fabricate it because of the fact that uh, the leakage currents due to the leakage current the information will be lost in the memory devices and diminishing returns in switching performance the returns of uh, the device are very low uh, switching performance is also very very important okay so now the question is uh, what are the properties of uh, uh, a good memory device a good memory device like we have discussed about uh, the static random access memory dynamic random access memory, flash memory, and ferroelectric random access memory, MRAM, then um, PC RAM, and then we also discussed about uh, the racetrack memory. Of course, like uh, all these things are uh, emerging memory technologies. Now still further, if you want to improve, like what one has to do, like a property of good memory device is basically, it must have very good endurance and long retention like that is why like uh, since there exists a long retention or endurance for the devices that we are using um, we are able to um, repeatedly use these devices that is what i mean by the endurance and the retention like uh, how long you can store the, how long you can store the information or how long you can switch the uh, you can switch the device state between high resistance state and the low resistance state like uh, how many years you can uh, uh, endure the system that is what i mean by the endurance of the device the density of uh, the memory should be large and the low power consumption the power that you must apply must be very small and then fast programming and access speed like you must be able to retrieve the information 
with uh, in a fast way and you should be able to access the information very fast these are the properties of uh, very good memories like uh, it exists one memory uh, resist to random access memory so so much of research is going uh, to develop this resist to random access memory like uh, so it is having very high speed less than uh, 300 picoseconds and then low powers 1 picojoules per operation the long endurance greater than uh, 10 power 12 cycles and it is simple structure it is having simple structure and uh, uh, it is also cmos compatible and excellent stability can be obtained below 10 nanometers like uh, whatever memory technologies that we discussed until now like uh, it can be a charged based one or it can be a magnetic based one like if you consider a charged based memories the drawbacks of uh, the charged based one is uh, the leakage currents the drawbacks of uh, the memories based upon magnetic materials is uh, super paramagnetic limit essentially uh, the super paramagnetic limit is basically like uh, whenever your material is in the ferromagnetic state and uh, when you go to the dimensions of the order of 10 nanometers or less than 10 nanometers so the magnetic moment will not be stable within the ferromagnetic state the device would exhibit a paramagnetic behavior as you know that uh, the paramagnetic in the paramagnetic material the magnetic moment direction will not be stable instead due to the thermal energy the magnetic moment will fluctuate we don't want that one to happen the fluctuating magnetic moment will not to retain the information that is why the ferromagnetic materials will have the limitations below 10 nanometers due to the super paramagnetic limit the super paramagnetism means within the ferromagnetic state when you approach the dimensions of the order of 10 nanometers or below 10 nanometers your magnetic moment will not be stable instead it will fluctuate that is why the information will be lost will be lost when you go to uh, super paramagnetic state we don't want happen to that one like uh, below 10 nanometers it is also having its own limitations so that is why this rram the resist to random access memory it is having excellent stability below 10 nanometers so the so much of research is going on in this direction the on the resist to random access memory devices what is a resist to random access memory it is having very simple structure uh, basically like you will have an oxide layer a dielectric layer and you will have a top electrode under the bottom electrode okay so this uh, this oxide layer you can deposit by pulse laser deposition and then top electrode on the bottom electrode you can deposit using uh, uh, e beam evaporation it is having as simple as structure very simple structure this is a vertical structure that means you will apply the current perpendicular to the plane perpendicular to the plane whereas this is a planar structure like you will have an oxide layer both the top electrode and the bottom electrode would be on top of the oxide layer that is why it is called planar structure or the measurement will be done in the cip structure current in plane current in plane and this is cpp current perpendicular to the plane this is the structure of uh, resistive random access memory device this is a walls uh, leading rm technology that is being uh, developed by the industrial technology research institute taiwan so <coughs> based upon the <coughs> half name oxide based one like as i mentioned like the half name oxide will be a dielectric layer and you will have a top electrode and the bottom electrode and then like uh, um, this this device uh, the device of rm based upon the half name oxide also showed excellent stability at uh, 200 degree centigrade even if you take uh, uh, your device to above room temperature up to higher temperatures of the order of 200 degree centigrade uh, it also performed very well like this is the fast reading of the order of uh, 7.2 nanoseconds the high endurance high endurance greater than uh, uh, 10 power 10 times 10 power, 10 power times 10 times the size scalability less than 50 nanometers still research is going on to uh, bring down it to less than 10 nanometers and then high speeds of that are less than 300 picoseconds one can one can retrieve the information um, or uh, one can uh, uh, use this device with the very high speeds of the order of 300 picoseconds okay now if you compare various uh, memory technologies in comparison with uh, the resist to random access memory like you have a single cell like material right power uh, switching time endurance and retention if you compare 
this resist to random access memory with uh, phase change memory and spin transfer torque uh, magnetic random access memory. The write power of this uh, resist to random access memory, it is uh, very low. Like that means uh, with uh, 50 microwatts itself, you can write the information. The switching time, it is almost comparable with the spin transfer torque uh, magnetic random access memory. Like uh, like you can have you can have switching time of the order of uh, five nanoseconds. The endurance characteristics will be of the order of 10 power 6 to 10 power 10. Okay. The retention, retention will be for 10 years. Like how long you can retain the information within the device. That is what mean by the retention. Okay. Um, we can store, we can, we can retain the information up to 10 years and uh, up to 85 degrees centigrade. 85 degrees centigrade or higher than the 85 degrees centigrade. As I just discussed, like half name oxide based uh, resist to random access memory could able to withstand up to 200 degrees centigrade. So the characteristics or the characteristics of uh, a resist to random access memory almost comparable with the spin transfer torque magnetic random access memory. As I just mentioned, like the magnetic random access memory will have its own limitations. So when the dimensions are less than 10 nanometers, we cannot use the MRAM technology store the information. So that is why the futuristic memory will be the resist to random access memory, which will have the equal uh, characteristics in comparison with the uh, uh, spin transfer torque memory or the phase change memory. At certain times, like in terms of the writing power, the RAM technology it is having a um, edge in comparison with uh, other memory technologies. So based on this, like uh, the classification of resist to random access memory, you can do as uh, two types or three types you can classify like unipolar resist to switching and a bipolar resist to switching okay so in a unipolar switching in a unipolar switching uh, the reset and set reset and set will happen only with one particular voltage that means what i mean by reset and what i mean by set the reset means going from low resistance state to the high resistance state and then uh, set means going from high resistance state to the low resistance state the reset and set can be obtained only with one particular polarity of the voltage. So that kind of resist to switching you can call as a unipolar resist to switching. That means unipolar with one polarity, you can you can access both high resistance state and the low resistance state. If you consider bipolar resist to switching, so in order to attain the reset as well as the set switching, you have to apply two different polarities, two different polarities like uh, the set and reset will happen at two different polarities. As a result, like uh, this is called as a bipolar resist to switching. To access the information, you have to apply two polarities. Two polarities. As a result, this is called bipolar resist to switching. Okay, like in this resist to switching, like you have uh, RAM utilizes 1D and 2D effects. Like uh, one-dimensional conducting channels will happen between the top electrode and the bottom electrode. Like uh, like this, I will show you. Yeah. If you see here uh, in an RM device, like uh, this is a dielectric material, you have a top electrode and you have a bottom electrode. Okay. Now, when you apply the potential difference between the top electrode and bottom electrode, what would happen is uh, the oxygen ions, the oxygen, oxygen, uh, there will be migration of uh, oxygen, uh, oxygen defects will be formed. So these defects will form a channel between the top electrode and the bottom electrode. These channels will have uh, the nature of one dimensional nature. One dimensional nature will be there. For instance, uh, if you have a continuous, uh, continuous uh, oxygen defects, you can call it as a low resistance state. Like if there is a rupturing of the filament, rupturing of the filament, there is no continuity over here. You can call it as a high resistance state. So what will happen? Uh, if the if the oxygen defects are continuous, that means um, the current will flow through these oxygen defects. So as uh, so, I mean, in, like uh, this device, like when current is flowing through the device, you can read this device state as uh, zero, low resistance state. So if there is an rupturing of the filament, the current flow will be stopped. As a result, this device uh, uh, will be read as high resistance state. Okay. Okay, there are um, the periodic table of elements like uh, transition metal oxides. 
the translucent metal oxides like titanium dioxide and hafnium oxide and then tin oxide the tantalum oxide zirconium oxide such kind of oxide materials or dielectric uh, dielectric materials you can use to develop the resist to random access memory but uh, it is it, it is very very difficult to establish a resist to switching phenomena um, in any device because uh, to attain a stable resist to switching like you have to test on various devices various devices sometimes you have to test on 50 to 100 devices like it is a huge process if you want to get a meaningful data meaningful data or meaningful results you have to work extensively this is a kind of uh, unipolar resistive switching people have obtained in uh, titanium dioxide and a bipolar resistive switching in the titanium dioxide on the same device you can have both unipolar resistive switching and bipolar resistive switching okay i hope that i have made you uh, understand different memory technologies and then what are the advantages and disadvantages of different memory technologies so now what i am going to do is uh, the different methods to prepare these memory technologies the nanostructure growth methods nanostructure growth methods like uh, thermal evaporation sputtering and e beam lithography and then like uh, then i will go to um, some of our work, memories based upon rram technology using the titanium dioxide so these technologies these memory technologies or uh, these devices you can develop using pvd technique pvd techniques like a physical vapor deposition techniques like uh, thermal evaporation or e beam evaporation or sputtering technique and uh, using the lithography technique lithography technique one can patent the device one can patent the device so this lithography can be uv ultraviolet rays or electron beam you can also use electron beam nowadays uh, x-rays are also being used so much of research in, is going in, in order to develop the x-ray lithography so let's try to see what is mean by a physical vapor deposition okay so the advantages are in the in the physical vapor deposition system the main important things are a chamber and then the vacuum system the vacuum system is the one which will suck the air molecules from the chamber okay once uh, you feel like you have acquired the reasonable amount of vacuum in the chamber then you will try to deposit okay so the vacuum levels like you would expect of the order of 10 power minus 6 tor 10 power minus 6 tor and then once if you create the vacuum within the chamber within the chamber you would have a boat you would have a boat on which you will put your desired material and then heat uh, heat this boat um, with uh, resist to heating, with resist to heating. So whenever he you heat any material, what would happen? It will try to melt and evaporate. Same thing will happen over here. Once if you heat uh, using the resist to methods, so this material will be evaporated and would deposit on top of the substrate. This is as simple as it is. Okay. So you would essentially have the substrates over here, and then due to the resist to heating of the material, the material will evaporate and deposit on top of uh, uh, the substrate okay so what all you would require is uh, create the vacuum within the chamber suppose if you don't create vacuum what will happen if you don't create vacuum whatever material that you are planning to evaporate that will get oxidized there will be foreign impurities in your material foreign your new foreign, foreign impurities that uh, the material that you are going to deposit so that is why always it is very important to create vacuum within the chamber before you do any deposition it can be a, a thermal evaporation or it can be a e beam evaporation or it can be a sputtering or it can be a pulse laser deposition to remove the uh, foreign impurities within the chamber you have to evacuate so the advantages of for this physical vapor deposition is basically versatile deposits almost any material like almost any metallic samples you can deposit uh, using this thermal evaporation technique okay and then very few chemical reactions like we don't have any chemical reactions over here like in case of uh, the chemical vapor deposition so where uh, near the substrate chemical reactions will take place and the material will be deposited in the physical vapor deposition particularly when you consider the thermal evaporation technique you don't have many chemical reactions and little vapor damage the damage of the vapor will be very limited and there are some limitations of uh, 
this uh, physical vapor, the thermal evaporation also, like uh, the thickness uniformity. Of course, the thickness uniformity is not a major problem nowadays because uh, um, you are basically trying to rotate your substrate while depositing the sample. Okay, so when you try to rotate your sample uh, while depositing the sample uh, while depositing the thin films, uh, like uh, the non-uniformity can be avoided. Okay, so the difficulty evaporate materials with low vapor pressures. So what I mean by low vapor pressures, like for instance, if you take manganese, manganese. It is having very low vapor pressure. As a result, the kind that kind of material, manganese kind of material, will be difficult to deposit using uh, uh, thermal evaporation. But it is not uh, uh, it is not possible. It, it, like it, 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 I, I I don't mean like it is not possible. It is possible to deposit, but it is uh, difficult. It is difficult. Like you have to apply very low powers for depositing the films. Almost any kind of material you can deposit uh, using this thermal evaporation. The most disadvantage of this thermal evaporation technique is uh, you have to use a lot of material. There will be material wastage, and also uh, the another important thing is uh, um, the thickness uniformity. Anyway, that you can avoid by rotating the sample. The most importantly, uh, the material wastage will be more. Okay, because uh, so much of material will be deposited on the chamber walls, and then uh, wherever it wants, it will deposit. Such kind of problem is there with the thermal evaporator. Thermal evaporator. So instead, one can also use uh, E-beam uh, evaporator instead of uh, uh, resistance heater. You would essentially use uh, electron beam, the uh, electron beam E-beam, and you will try to focus electron beam on top of the material. And because of the heating, the material will be evaporated and deposited on top of the substrate. The principle is same. You would have a chamber and evacuate the chamber with the vacuum system in combination of uh, the rotary plus uh, um, diffusion pump, diffusion pump, rotary will give the vacuum of the order of 10 power minus 3 torr, and then diffusion pump will give the vacuum of the order of uh, 10 power minus 6. Like you have to use the combination, you cannot just use the diffusion pump. Once if you attain 10 power minus 3 torr within the chamber, like uh, then you have to switch on the diffusion pump to attain 10 power minus 6. You have to use the combination of uh, both the things. Of course, nowadays people are also using the turbo molecular pump to create vacuums of the order of uh, Ultra high vacuum, like of the order of 10 power minus 7 to 10 power minus 8 tor. Like you can also attach a turbo molecular pump to this thermal operating system. But these are some of uh, the few details about uh, the physical vapor deposition technique. Like another important uh, uh, technique that uh, a nanotechnologist, or if you want to grow a material uh, less than 10 nanometers or 1 nanometer, is basically the sputtering technique. The sputtering. Okay. So there, there exist uh, two kinds of sputtering, DC sputtering as well as uh, the RF sputtering. The DC sputtering direct current uh, sputtering technique, RF sputtering is uh, radio frequency technique sputtering. Okay. So the DC sputtering one can use uh, to deposit uh, metallic samples, whereas RF sputtering you can use to deposit uh, oxide films as well, oxide films as well, because uh, when you try to use uh, DC sputtering for uh, uh, the oxide films, what would happen is there will be charging effect. Because of this charging effect, uh, the atoms will not be ejected from the target material. Okay, to avoid this problem, one has to use uh, the RF sputtering um, to avoid the charging effect. Okay, so how it works, how a RF sputtering or a DC sputtering will work. So, as I mentioned, like for any uh, deposition technique, you would have a chamber, you would have a chamber. The principle of the sputtering technique is different in comparison with the thermal evaporation. So you will have a cathode and the anode. So between them, you would actually feel the argon gas. You will actually feel the argon gas. So, so after filling the argon gas, you will apply the potential difference between the top electrode and the bottom electrode. Okay. Once if you create, once if you apply the potential difference between the top electrode and the bottom electrode, so the argon atoms will ionize argon plus electron minus. This electron will go and interact with the other argon atom that will again argon ion will come. So you'd essentially create argon plasma, argon plasma within the chamber. Okay. So this argon plasma will be moving towards uh, the material, the target material. So what would happen is there will be momentum transfer between uh, your argon ion and uh, the target uh, atoms, target atoms. So this argon atom, this argon ion, now you cannot call it as an atom. It is basically ion, argon ion will eject 
the atom from the target material by transferring the momentum. There will be momentum transfer between uh, argon ion and uh, your target atom. So this ejected atom will go and deposit on top of uh, the substrate material. Okay. So like uh, you can uh, again, you can also apply the rotation and then heating for the substrate to get uh, good ad good adhesion between uh, the atoms that are being deposited and to get uh, the uniform uh, films uniform films okay now i will show you a schematic like a schematic diagram how argon plasma will be generated and these like uh, argon atoms will come they will eject the atoms from the target material so these ejected atoms will go on deposit on top of uh, the substrate like uh, your your uh, your substrate will be rotating your substrate will be rotating and uh, by rotating you can actually get uh, the uniform films so this is how a sputtering process will happen so over here um, the maroon color shows that it is basically in within the argon plasma this entire process will happen like as i mentioned like you can also deposit to multi layer films using this uh, multi layer films like by having uh, different targets one target two targets and three targets you can deposit uh, um, coarse sputtering. Coarse sputtering means uh, deposit all the materials at a time. The multi layers means like you have to put a shadow for the remaining two targets and uh, open only one target when you wanted to deposit single layer. First, like when you wanted to deposit to multi layers, what you must do is first you close this um, this target and this target, open only this one so that uh, um, you'll deposit only this material. And then next, close this and this, open only this. Uh, the second material will be deposited. Then uh, remaining two, these two you can close and only this will be open, third material will be deposited. So depending on your requirement, you can deposit any material, any metallic samples using this uh, sputtering technique. So this is the, the most versatile and mostly used device, mostly used device to uh, grow any nanostructures in any sophisticated laboratory. The sputtering technique, it is a very powerful technique. You can deposit uh, thin films of the order of one nanometer or less than one nanometer using this one. Okay. So of course there are some limitations even below one nanometer up to 0.5 nanometers. Or uh, if you have very good sputtering system, you can also go up to 0.2 nanometers. Like uh, any any material can be deposited wherever you go in the world. Like uh, in any world class laboratory, you can find the sputtering technique. Another important uh, deposition technique is uh, pulse laser deposition technique. Uh, the chamber initially pulse laser deposition mostly like uh, um, um, you can actually um, impinge laser on top of the target material. So as soon as you impinge the laser on top of the target material, the material will evaporate and deposit on top of the substrate. Okay. So the chamber is evacuated to a vacuum of the order of 10 power minus 6 star initially. The oxygen gas is circulated inside the chamber at a pressure of about uh, 300 milliliter. The laser is then focused on the target using uh, the focusing arrangement, focusing lens you have to use. The target surface is lapped so that uh, it is free from the surface contamination. Okay. Like if you see, um, first laser deposition, like uh, as soon as uh, laser falls on top of the target material, the plume will be generated. This is the kind of plume that one can imagine. This plume, uh, the material plume, will go and deposit on top of the material. So this entire process, like if you see, um, the laser will fall on the target material, and then material will be evaporated. Like you can imagine, like uh, breaking of the bonds like this. As soon as the laser falls on the material, the material will evaporate, and it will deposit on the, the substrate. So this is how one can imagine a pulse laser deposition. So initially, what would happen is as soon as you impinge the laser on top of uh, uh, that material that you wanted to deposit, so there will be absorption of the heat. So I is equal to I naught into e to the power of uh, minus alpha x. So there will be thermal conduction. As a result, the surface melting will happen. The surface melting will happen. After melting, the vaporization, the vaporization will happen. So this va vaporization, the plasma emission will happen, and this material will go and uh, deposit uh, this plasma. This material, this uh, gas will go on deposit on top of the substrate. So starting from the impinging the laser to the deposition, it only takes 30 nanoseconds. 30 nanoseconds, very fast, very fast. So in this way, you don't waste so much of material 
at the same time uh, uh, the cosine distribution of uh, uh, the deposition will be a straight line for uh, the pulse laser deposition the straight line for the pulse laser deposition like uh, for instance if you consider um, a thermal evaporator technique thermal evaporation technique the cosine distribution law will be like uh, circle and uh, for a sputtering technique the cosine distribution will be law like uh, ellipse kind of nature and for a pulse laser deposition it will be like a straight line as soon as uh, you impinge laser on top of the material the material will be deposited immediately okay once if you deposit the material like uh, one can uh, characterize the material using the x-ray diffraction technique and then uh, the secondary electron microscope technique and then the magnetic characterization can be done by vibrating sample magnetometer okay so the x-ray diffraction is basically once the Bragg's law condition is satisfied 2d sine theta is equal to n lambda is satisfied then you can actually observe the diffraction pattern uh, uh, you can actually observe um, the peaks in the 2 theta versus intensity graph of x-ray diffraction okay the basic criteria is that uh, the incident x-ray wavelength must be comparable with respect to with respect to the interplanar spacing okay then only diffraction condition will be satisfied okay the secondary electron microscope technique it would actually use the electrons it would actually use electrons the electrons will fall or the incoming electrons will fall on the sample and then uh, once these electrons are uh, once electrons fall on top of the sample what would happen is there will be many extracts like secondary electrons backscattered electrons argued electrons x-rays cathode luminescence light so these are the extracts from the sample once the incoming electrons falls on the material like uh, the origin of uh, these extracts these outputs may be from different locations of the material but however these are the extracts from the material once if you impinge the electrons on top of the sample the secondary electrons they would give information about uh, uh, the morphology the surface morphology of the sample and then the backscattered electrons the backscattered electrons these are basically the backscattered from the nucleus of uh, your atom so these backscattered electrons will actually give information about different phases that exist in your material for instance if you have ab1 and ab2 phases in your material the clear color contrast can be identified using this backscattered electrons like backscattered electron image like your argued electrons mostly that would be used to um, characterize the ultra thin films like uh, the top few layers the top few layer composition can be found using the argued electron spectroscopy whereas x-rays the x-rays are fingerprint for the particular element like the x-rays also can be obtained after impinging the electrons on the sample this for using this x-rays one can find uh, uh, the composition of the material so basically this uh, uh, secondary electron microscope will be used to uh, get the morphology of the sample it can be used to uh, find it can be it can be used to find uh, the backscattered electron image to identify different phases that, that exist in the material and one can also get information about the composition of the material using the x-rays that would be emanated from the sample okay these are some of advanced some of the advantages of uh, the secondary electron microscope of course the vibrating sample magnetometer or highly sophisticated techniques you can use for further characterization so to summarize uh, so since uh, um, so since i have to cover many other things like basically to summarize the secondary electron microscope plus uh, edax the energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy will be used to uh, get the surface morphology plus the composition analysis sem will give the surface morphology edax will give the composition analysis argued electron spectroscopy aes will give um, the composition composition of uh, the top layers of uh, the thin films xps x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy it actually gives uh, the state the valence state of the element like for instance if you consider the titanium dioxide the titanium will have the four place state how do you know that whether it is in four place state or three place state so that kind of information you can obtain from the x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy the rutherford backscattering in conjunction with ion beam channeling you can actually get information about uh, the composition of the material and you can also measure the strains that exist in the at the interface okay the sims secondary ion mass spectroscopy also can be used to find the composition of the material 
So the auger electron spectroscopy, XPS, and SIMS are true surface analytical technique. So true surface analytical technique within a depth of uh, 15 angstroms. EDAX and RBS generally uh, sample the total thickness of the film up to one micrometers, and frequently a portion of the substrate as well, like uh, up to 200 uh, uh, angstroms, up to one micrometer uh, depth. You can you can um, um, up to one micrometer depth. You can believe the information from the EDAX. Okay. So auger electron spectroscopy, XPS, and SIMS cannot detect all the elements in the periodic table. Like for instance, if you consider the hydrogen, you cannot detect using this one. Okay. Of course, there are some limitations for these techniques as well. Okay, now once if you know uh, how to deposit the films and how to characterize the film, so you can use the lithography uh, lithography to pattern your devices. So there are two different uh, uh, lithographic techniques like uh, UV lithography and then E-beam lithography. UV lithography, in the UV lithography, you would essentially use um, ultraviolet rays and then E-beam lithography, you would use electron beam, electron beam. So the electron beam lithography uh, is a technique that is used for the fabrication of uh, the micro and nanostructures. Micro and nanostructures, you can uh, fabricate using the electron beam lithography. Based on the chemical modification of the polymer resist film caused by the electron irradiation. Okay, the resolution, the minimum feature size that uh, you can write using this uh, U-beam lithography or uh, UV lithography can be defined by K1 into lambda by N into A, where lambda is the wavelength of the light and A is the numerical aperture of the lens as seen from the wafer, as seen from the wafer, okay? So this actually de uh, defines what is the minimum feature size that you can write using this technique. Like for instance, if you take uh, um, UV light. So the since the wavelength is very small, wavelength based upon the wavelength, uh, you cannot write uh, uh, less than uh, 50 nanometers using or up to of, of the order of micrometer size. Micrometer size you can write using uh, uh, UV lithography. Whereas uh, electron beam lithography, you can write between 10 nanometers to 50 nanometers. Okay, it all depends upon the wavelength of the light or the wavelength of uh, the writing thing that you are using. Okay, there are, uh, if you consider the electron beam lithography, like uh, uh, to generate the electrons, you'll have the thermonic emitters, uh, photo emitters, the field emitters. Most often, like people will be using the thermonic emitter, like you, you'll have a thermonic emitter, and then you'll have a um, uh, beam blanker, and then deflection coils to deflect uh, this uh, electron beam. And then this entire thing will be in the vacuum chamber, vacuum chamber, and then you'll have uh, a substrate, a substrate on which um, a photoresist will be deposited, and on which a photoresist will be deposited. Now, what will happen is whenever electron beam with a focus, focused electron beam falls or impinges on top of uh, uh, photoresist, it actually breaks uh, the bonds in the photoresist. So that you can get the desired structure. Like initially, you'll fed your desired structure in the computer, and then accordingly, computer uh, will give instructions to different uh, uh, coils, different coils and beam blanker, like uh, where the electron beam has to go. Accordingly, the structures will be written on top of uh, the substrate using the photoresist. Okay. So. The protocol is basically the sample is coated with the thin layer of uh, uh, resist. So most often uh, one would use uh, polymethyl uh, methacrylate, PMMA. The PMMA is the one which is being used uh, most often. The PMMA breaks down into monomers upon exposure to electrons. The exposed regions can be rinsed away using a chemical, which we, which we can call as a MIBIC, like uh, Methyl isobutyl ketene. Okay, these are some of the chemicals that would use uh, to deposit uh, or uh, to um, develop the substrate. So of course, there are some disadvantages also with EBL, like uh, slower than optical lithography, and it is expensive. Uh, forward scattering can happen, back backward scattering can happen, secondary electrons can emanate. Like this is a kind of uh, typical E-beam lithography that one can imagine. Like this is basically uh, the right based uh, electron beam lithography. 
and these are the kind of uh, structures that you can uh, develop using uh, the electron beam lithography like you can develop any kind of structures vertical structures horizontal structure like uh, circle shaped structure u shaped structure and a grid you can get and then diamond kind of structure any kind of structure that uh, you can develop um, of course before uh, you uh, get these structures what you have to do is uh, using the uh, using the software you have to write your own uh, structure then fed to the computer so that uh, electron beam will write accordingly and these are some of the process steps that will be involved okay um, these are some of uh, the process steps that we can involve like uh, the spin coating of uh, the resist initially you will take a substrate and a, a photo resist will be deposited on top of uh, the substrate using the spin coating the spin coating of uh, resist solution on top of the surface once if you have the photo resist on top of uh, uh, the substrate um, the exposure you expose uh, the electron beam electron beam to the you, ex you expose electron beam to the um, photo resist so that uh, uh, you will have the valleys and heights in the regions where you want okay so once if you are once you are done with the exposure of electron beam you do the lift off process using the lift, lift off process you can actually get uh, the desired structure once if you have this kind of structure then use uh, your sputtering technique or thermal evaporation technique to deposit uh, your actual material okay this is how one can deposit uh, the materials using the combination of uh, the electron beam lithography and uh, the sputtering technique of course there are uh, two different types of uh, uh, photo resist like negative photo resist and the positive photo resist so in case of negative photo resist after the development the exposed structure is higher than the surrounding due to the cross linking of polymer chains whereas in the positive photo resist after the development the exposed structure is uh, deeper than the surrounding uh, due to the chopping of polymer chains of course depending on the requirement you can use the negative photo resist or positive photo resist however the pmma is the positive photo resist and these are some of uh, the characteristics of uh, the pmma like uh, one of the first e-beam resist still uh, people believe only this pmma and then uh, it is a standard photo resist positive photo resist the resolution you can get up to less than 10 nanometers and then uh, availability with uh, high uh, high and low molecular weight nine uh, and contrast high for 950k resist and low for 50k resist okay some of the challenges with this um, beam lithography is basically the charging effect uh, like charging effect like uh, a complicated extract focusing of uh, electron beam like suppose if uh, the charges are formed on on your material it is highly difficult to focus uh, the electron beam on top of uh, the photoresist okay so highly difficult okay so this kind of uh, uh, charging effects can happen within your device and the other challenge is basically the charging effect like avoid you can avoid this uh, um, uh, charging effect by spin coating a conducting polymer on top of the photoresist before uh, you expose electron beam uh, to the actual photoresist you have to deposit a conducting polymer like a metallic film a thin metallic film you have to deposit on top of uh, the uh, pmma before you uh, expose electron beam to the photoresist okay particularly uh, those materials uh, which gives uh, more charging effect proximity effect can also happen like yields unwanted additional exposure additional exposure what happens is like uh, initially you wanted to write a device structure like this but however you will be ended up with uh, uh, mixed structure so to avoid this problem um, you can avoid uh, you, you can you can you can uh, accelerate the electrons with uh, very low um, voltage like less than 5 kilo electron volts the proximity effect correction software or the double layer technique the double layer technique you can use to avoid the proximity effect okay so using the combination of uh, the thin film and lithography technique one can make nano devices and aforesaid devices would be used for the the spin tronic uh, spin electronics or nano electronics or opto electronic devices so the nano technology uh, made it possible for us to develop uh, very fine uh, devices through which we could able to store more information more information in uh, very less space the density the density is very high very high 
uh, and it, it 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 has been possible only due to the nanotechnology and particularly it is because of the electron beam lithography and uh, because of uh, various deposition techniques that we have like it is basically due to the combination of uh, the lithography techniques and then the pvd the physical vapor deposition techniques like thermal evaporation and uh, the sputtering technique okay now uh, up to now we have seen uh, the current memory technologies memory technologies then we also have seen nanostructures growth like how one can uh, grow such kind of materials using the combination of uh, electron beam lithography and then sputtering techniques so now uh, what i would like to do is i will take one example like uh, the memory based on rm and their remote control remote control like uh, i would like to a uh, little bit focus on uh, uh, rm device which will be a futuristic memory for us and then i also show you how to control the charge transport in rm devices in a remote way okay so for this work we have chosen the titanium dioxide the development of titanium dioxide based rm device for memory applications or remote control of uh, titanium dioxide based rm device for the memory memory applications so i think uh, professor subramanyam has extensively focused more on the titanium dioxide i am not going into the details of uh, the titanium dioxide like it is basically it basically consists uh, three different phases anatized rutile and brookite in this work we have used uh, uh, anatized phase the motivation of this work why we have done like this work has been published in uh, scientific reports and it's basically the nature publishing group so the controlling of uh, switching mechanism as i discussed previously rm device control it's basically based on the voltage like suppose if you want to attain the unipolar resistive switching or bipolar resistive switching you have to apply the voltage okay so that means only one degree of freedom exists to control uh, the device characteristics so essentially the controlling the switching mechanism voltage is well established hinting that only one degree of freedom exists to control the switching mechanism okay now what we wanted to do is we wanted to control it using the magnetic field so the magnetic field control of for transport or switching mechanism in a remote way is a new dimension and this will also give additional degree of freedom to control the charge transport where the switching can be tuned without any physical contact that is advantage or that is the beauty of the magnetic field you won't actually touch the device instead uh, you would actually control the entire charge transport externally like in a remote way you can control okay so using this work what we have demonstrated is that so in addition to voltage we can also control an electronic device with the magnetic field with the magnetic field okay so that is what um, is mentioned in this in this paper the scientific reports paper <clears throat> this is the kind of uh, x-ray diffraction pattern that we have obtained in addition to titanium dioxide we also have the peaks from uh, fluorine doptin oxide okay so this is uh, two theta versus angle like we got uh, uh, we got the peaks corresponding to the titanium dioxide which exists in the space group and this is the fe semi image of uh, the thin film like uh, the grain size what we found is of the order of uh, 50 to 60 nanometers and composition is of the order of uh, uh, 1 is to 2 like uh, that is how it should be titanium is 1 and oxygen 2 and this we have obtained through edax energy dispersive x ray spectroscopy so in order to identify or in order to confirm the chemical states of uh, the film like we have done Uh, x-ray photo electron spectroscopy xps so xps uh, showed that there exists a titanium as well as oxygen peaks the titanium is in the uh, four plus state that is what uh, we have identified from the x-ray uh, xps x-ray photo electron spectroscopy xps spectrum confirms presence of uh, titanium and oxygen the gaussian deconvolution peak fitting of uh, titanium xps spectra at uh, 459.3 electron volts and 465 electron volts confirm the presence of uh, titanium 4 plus on the outermost surface with a peak separation of 5.7 electron volts as you see here you could see two peaks corresponding to the titanium 4 plus and the oxygen uh, one spectrum can be fitted by the two gaussian peaks centered at 530.5 electron volts and 532.2 electron volts which are due to the formation of oxygen vacancies and adsorbed oxygen so this is how we obtained the oxygen peak okay 
from this we confirm that in our film we have both the oxygen and titanium more importantly the titanium is in the four plus state okay this is a kind of device that we have developed using the technique that we discussed like um, we have a bottom electrode fto substrate and uh, titanium dioxide the active material and then the contact pads az okay so the potential difference applied between the top electrode and the bottom electrode here we follow cpp structure that means current will flow perpendicular to the film so these are the device characteristics we have obtained initially we were there at uh, uh, at lower at high resistance state like uh, at high resistance state as i go in the negative direction uh, from the high resistance state like uh, around uh, 3.5 volts 3.5 volts the device has been transformed to the low resistance state so this low resistance state continued even after increasing the voltage up to uh, 5 volts and again when i come from uh, uh, when i come from uh, um, low resistance state again to zero device has transformed to um, the high resistance state so essentially what it means is that in order to get both the resistance state high resistance state and the low resistance state you have to apply two different polarities for the device that means it is a kind of uh, the bipolar resistor switching okay so as i discussed for a bipolar resistor switching you need to apply two different polarities two different polarities okay so different with different um, models space charge limited conduction mechanism and the short k emission mechanism we have explained uh, the device character okay this is the physical phenomena <coughs> physical phenomena like uh, the space charge limited conduction mechanism initially when uh, v is less than v trap v trap voltage what would happen is uh, the thermally generated uh, uh, free carriers free carriers will dominate like as you as you apply as you increase more and more voltage what would happen is uh, some at certain point of time <coughs> the thermally generated charge carriers will be balanced with the uh, injected charge carriers after after higher voltages higher voltages the traps will be filled with electrons trap will be filled with electrons okay the high resistance state of uh, device we have explained using uh, um, using the short key emission mechanism okay now the main important result main important result is uh, controlling the resistance switching characteristics with the magnetic field the magnetic field over here uh, we have applied the magnetic field perpendicular to the device configuration perpendicular this, this no not perpendicular parallel to the current the current is moving plane perpendicular from uh, this direction in the in the in the y direction whereas the magnetic field is applied in the x direction you have to remember that one because there is a phys there is one physical phenomena uh, which will help us to explain that characteristics that we have obtained okay so these are the kind of uh, device characteristics that we have applied like uh, you have applied uh, the magnetic field uh, with various strengths from 33 i studs to 3000 i studs what we could see is that wherever the device switch from uh, high resistance state to the low resistance state we could see the systematic variation for the switching voltages with the different magnetic fields with the different magnetic fields so this um, we also plotted uh, the graph between the magnetic field versus abrupt voltage what we could see is there is a systematic increase in the uh, switching voltage switching voltage so this we this kind of behavior this kind of behavior we have obtained only when the magnetic field is applied perpendicular to the direction of the electron motion however when we applied the magnetic field parallel to the electron motion we don't see such effect so this we can explain uh, using a phenomenon called lorentz force effect lorentz force effect like initially the electric field is basically uh, it's a combination of applied electric field plus uh, uh, induced hall field induced hall field so the combined effect of lorentz force and the force due to the hall effect and a charge is essentially zero initially like uh, without any effect the fl minus fh is equal to zero so this equation is true only if the charges move with the average drift velocity for instance if the average drift velocity within the device is greater than the drift velocity the lorentz force will dominate uh, the hall force so as a result of this residual lorentz force what would happen is that uh, uh, the electrons will spend more time within the device and electrons would attain the spiral motion 
for which we have to apply more amount of uh, uh, electric, more amount of electric to switch the device. As a result of uh, increased Lorentz force, what we could see is the systematic uh, shift for the switching voltages uh, with increasing the magnetic field. Okay, so this essentially uh, Lorentz force, the residual Lorentz force, is the one which is responsible for the shifting of uh, uh, the switching voltages. But we also have done the endurance characteristics of uh, the titanium dioxide based device. We could able to switch the resistance state between high and low. So the memory window of the cell uh, is calculated uh, using the formula R of minus R on by R on. Uh, we got a factor of 10. The 10 is sufficient to distinguish the information between 1 and 0, 1 and 0. That means if you are in the high resistance state, you can read the information as 1. If you are in the low resistance state, you can read the information as 0. We also tried to get the endurance characteristics with different magnetic fields. What we could see is that uh, we could uh, see the variation in the resistance state with the different magnetic fields, with the different magnetic fields. More clearly, we have chosen a uh, few particular voltages, few particular voltages, and tried to control the resistance states. We have chosen minus 7 volts, minus 6, minus 5, and minus 4 volts, and plus 2 volts. So these, uh, as these voltages, are in the low resistance state, and this is in the high resistance state. For instance, if I consider uh, at 6 volts, if I expand this region, if I expand this region, with the different magnetic field strengths, with different magnetic field strength, we could clearly see a resistance change from 16, 1675 to 1750, 1750 ohms. What does it mean? If you plot the graph between the magnetic field versus change in the resistance, we could see almost a 4% change in the resistance. 4% change in the magneto resistance of the device. That means uh, this is a very much significant and then we could able to tune the resistance state. One can also obtain uh, the multi-level resistor switching with the magnetic field. We could able to tune the resistance state with the magnetic field. That means the multi-level resistor switching, the multi-level states uh, one can access using different magnetic fields. In order to confirm, in order to confirm, as I mentioned, like uh, uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, the kind of channels that would be found between the top electrode and the bottom electrode um, through oxygen defects, I wa we wanted to check whether uh, the oxygen defects are responsible for this phenomena or not, for this resistive switching phenomena or not. In order to confirm that, we have done an excellent measurement, basically the CAF measurement conducting atomic force microscopy. So this conductive atomic force microscopy, it actually gives the conducting channels that exist in your material. So like we have used a platinum iridium coated antimony and doped silicon tips, so our here tip, and we applied a potential difference between the top electrode and the bottom electrode. Okay, we used the tapping mode as I shown here. The curvature radius, the curvature uh, radius is basically of the order of uh, 20 nanometers. The oscillating frequency that we used is 13 kilohertz and cantilever spring constant is uh, 0.2 newton per meters newton per meters so we we fed laser light with a optical fiber with an optical fiber what happens is that whenever there is a deflection whenever there is a deflection from the sample so the position of the optical fiber position of the laser which will flow through this optical fiber on phd will change and accordingly you can actually map the conducting channels that would exist on top of the sample Okay, so this is the kind of internal structure like electronic structure that one can image. Like you have a conducting probe, you will apply the potential difference between the top electrode and the bottom electrode. You would use the amplifiers and the filters and to the ADC analog to digital conversion. Okay, so this is the kind of results that we have obtained. Like uh, we have applied two different uh, voltages, one at zero and another one at uh, a minus eight volts. What we could see is that when we apply, when we don't apply any voltages, we don't see anything, anything like we just uh, got some plain, plain substrate. Like current is basically zero. The current uh, mapping that we have found is basically zero uh, when we don't apply any voltage. However, uh, when we applied the voltage of the order of minus eight volts, minus eight volts, we could see uh, some kind of uh, current channels. As you could see, the current is of the order of uh, 1.7 nano amperes. So this is the kind of uh, precision that I am talking about. The current levels uh, would be of the order of uh, 1.7 nano amperes. 
So the current of 1.7 nano amperes is detected using the CAFM technique. That means uh, what we can confirm from this experiment is that uh, the kind of resistive switching phenomena that we have observed in our device is basically due to uh, current conduction channel mechanism or due to the oxygen defects. So these oxygen defects are forming conducting channels between the bottom electrode to the top electrode, which actually leads to current flow between the top electrode and the bottom electrode. Okay. So whenever uh, there is a rupturing of the filaments, you don't see such kind of uh, uh, conducting channels. Okay. Now the roadmap to the future storage technologies, future storage technologies, like we have DRAM and we have MRAM, and we also have the biochip, bio RAM, the bio resist to random access memory. Of course, we also try to develop this bio resist to random access memory using the titanium dioxide based device. The bio resist to random access memory, it is basically the vision for tomorrow. So what we have done is we have attached biomolecules, biomolecules on top of uh, this titanium dioxide, titanium dioxide. So again, this is the kind of uh, device that one can imagine, the bio RM device that one can imagine. Like you have FTO substrate and then titanium dioxide and you have um, contact pads. And uh, we also attached the biomolecules to the active material, biomolecules to the active material. We have developed two different kinds of devices, one with graphene oxide, another one without graphene oxide. And the small particles that you see here, the small particles that you see here, so they are basically the BSA, the bovine serum albumin that we have detected, uh, um, that we have detected using our device. Okay, and this is the kind of uh, the uh, transmission electron microscope image that we have obtained. We could see uh, the diffraction rings from the side pattern, and then we also could see, we also could measure uh, the the size of the nanoparticle, the size of the nanoparticle, okay? And this, this is the kind of uh, the device characteristics that we have obtained. Like initially, this is uh, the device characteristics with only titanium, with only titanium dioxide. When we added a bovine serum albumin, when we added a bovine serum albumin, what we could see is, uh, we could see only, um, we could see a change in the switching voltage, and we tried to increase the concentration of the bovine serum albumin. What we could see is basically um, the switching voltage, the switching voltage is reduced to the lower voltages, lower voltages as we increase the concentration of the bovine serum movement. That means whatever device uh, that we have developed is basically sensitive for the bovine serum movement. Okay, this is the first time we have developed a bio RM, bio RM uh, to detect, to detect uh, the biomolecules, okay. These are the endurance characteristics of the device that we have uh, measured. Like we could see the variation between the high resistance state and low resistance state of the order of 200. That means uh, the device information, device information uh, can be distinguished in a precise way, in a precise way. Like uh, initially we had uh, 12 between the high resistance state and low resistance state. When we try to add graphene, when we try to add graphene oxide, we could see we could enhance uh, the gap between high resistance state to low resistance state of the order of uh, 73. When we added uh, bovine serum malbumin, like we could enhance the uh, gap between the high resistance state and low resistance state of the order of 200. That means the information can be identified in a highly precise way, highly precise way. So this is the kind of uh, CAFM images that we have obtained. Like when you applied minus nine volts and uh, plus nine, volt, nine volts, we could see conducting channels when we try to apply plus nine volts. We don't see uh, much current. We don't see, G, we, we do see zero current when we apply minus nine volts. As I mentioned, like uh, this device exhibits bipolar resistive switching at one particular voltage. At a negative voltage, it shows uh, a low resistance state and a positive voltage, it shows high resistance state. Okay, the conclusions are basically like uh, we have successfully established the bipolar resistive switching in titanium dioxide based RM devices and we control the bipolar resistive switching uh, in this device in a remote way and the observation of memory window uh, is of the order of 10 when we try to add graphene oxide we could able to increase it to 70 and when we try to add BSA we could able to enhance it to uh, 200 of the order of 200 
and controlling the endurance characteristics in a remote way, we could able to get uh, multi-level resistor switching by controlling the resistor random access memory with the magnetic field. And also we try to we try to develop a bio RM bio RM device which actually detects the bowen serum malbumin. Like for instance, what are the advantages of this bowen serum malbumin? Like we have the human serum albumin, human serum albumin, like in our uh, human bodies. Uh, the human serum albumin is the one which transfers the enzymes and proteins from one body part to the another body part. Okay. So the structural similarities of uh, the human serum albumin and the bovine serum albumin uh, are similar. That is the reason why we have chosen this bovine serum albumin as a model protein. Model protein. Once this works for bovine serum albumin, our device will also be sensitive for the human serum albumin. That is the basic idea why we have chosen the bovine serum albumin to develop the bioresistor random access memory. Like finally, the CAFM images indicates that uh, the switching mechanism is due to the conduction channels, conducting channels, and it also proves that uh, the conduction conduction channel mechanism that we have obtained uh, is because of uh, the oxygen defects. Okay, with this, I would like to thank everyone for your kind attention, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you so much, sir where it was really an informative session. I'll start with some of the questions. Yeah. Our first question is, how can we overcome the disadvantage of optical lithography, which you have mentioned in the slide? See, optical lithography, I mean, as such, there is no disadvantage for the, I have, I'm getting a lot of noise. Hello? I'm getting a lot of noise, okay. So, I mean, as such, there is no disadvantage of optical lithography. Optical lithography, um, using optical lithography, you can write the structures of the order of uh, micrometers, of the order of micrometers. E-beam lithography, you can write the structures of the order of 10 nanometers, okay? We could able to write uh, uh, 10 nanometers using E-beam lithography because of the wavelength of electron beam because of the wavelength of the electrons. That is the only difference. Whereas the optical lithography, it is having higher wavelength. Um, E-beam lithography, it will, like, uh, it will have the lower wavelength. That is the only, only difference. Other, otherwise, so both have their own advantages. Like for instance, if you want to, um, if you want to write the structures of the order of micrometers, optical lithography is best. If you want to write the structures of the order of nanometers, electron beam lithography, would be best. Our next question is, what is the scope of research in spintronics field? Oh, okay. So the, in spintronics field, there is a lot of scope. So a lot of scope in the sense that uh, the nano electronics that we have seen, like uh, earlier people were thinking like uh, people were not using the spin part of uh, the electron. Like we were having uh, only we were using only the charge part of the electron. So the combination of uh, the charge as well as spin will lead to a new field, uh, which we can call as the spintronics, the spin electronics, the electronics based upon the spin, okay? So essentially here, what you do is you manipulate the spin orientation and store more information. For instance, uh, if you see, if I, if I, if I show, initially I showed a device, which actually uh, works like, uh, let me show you that device. Okay, so this MRAM, the magnetic random access memory device that you are seeing here, it is basically based upon the spintronics, the manipulation of the spin in different layers of uh, magnetic material using the magnetic field that you supply through bit, bit line, bit line over the wall line. As I mentioned, like another scope is racetrack memory, basically the domain wall motion devices, domain wall motion devices. You can actually grow ferromagnetic nanowires and push this uh, domain walls using the spin polarized currents and store more information within the device. Like if you can arrange all the magnetic nanowires vertically, you can store more information in this uh, magnetic nanowire. So there is a lot of scope uh, in the spintronic fields. Like you can also develop the microwave microwave devices, and then you can also develop uh, storage devices. So, so much of scope is there. Uh, as far as uh, spin electronics is concerned. Thank you, sir. I'm done with the questions. I once again thank 
for your wonderful lecture yeah, thank you thank you madam uh shani alwala are we closing for the day yes sir we are closing for the day feedback link will be given in a short time uh, in this group uh, also uh, do you have a special you have a group uh, separately yes sir you we already have that session? you can close the session we'll post it in the telegram and whatsapp i think there is one more question uh i did not find sir you don't find okay fine there is one question on bio or them Where is it, sir? I'm unable. Uh, what are what are the scope of research in uh, bio memory storage devices and how it is linked with uh, uh, semiconductor storage through neuron system? Okay, very good. So this bio memory, like, uh, madam, can you switch off the microphone? Shani, can you? Yeah. Okay. So this bio resist to random this RAM devices can also be used for the neuromorphic computing. neuromorphic computing basically like uh, um uh, this neuromorphic computing um it's basically the brain inspired computing so whatever functionalities our brain does you can actually mimic using this uh, resist to random access memory in fact we also have done on the neuromorphic computing using the resist to random access memory so based upon the titanium dioxide itself we try to uh, get the analog the analog resist to switching analog resist to instead of having a, a sharp switching for the resistance we will have a gradual switching so the kind of characteristics um, that we have obtained so they are basically mimicking the brain inspired computing the brain inspired computing the such uh, resist to random access memories can also be used for the brain inspired computing once if you observe um, the characteristics of uh, um, brain using this rram devices so one more question sir yeah. what are the drawbacks of spin coating technique compared to the sputtering technique which can be preferred to get better films okay the spin coating technique is basically uh, like uh, you cannot get the uniform films using uh, the spin coating technique so the density the density will be very poor uh, for a spin coating technique okay so when you use the sputtering technique you will get very highly dense film you will not you cannot find almost any pores within your thin film whereas uh, if you develop a film using the spin coating and put under microscope you may see a uh, few you may see a uh, few pores within the film that means uh, your film may not be uniform and then uh, using the spin coating technique uh, you can get the films uh, thickness of the order of micrometers okay whereas in sputtering you can get thin films of the order of uh, 1 nanometer 0.5 nanometers you can get very uh, thin samples you can grow using sputtering techniques which is not possible using the spin coating technique uh, that's it sir we are done with the questions fine madam yeah. thank, thank you very you. much vanan garu uh, and yes. uh, shiva can you conclude and close this uh, session for today yes sir yes sir i thank all the participants for participating in our today's uh, sttp program i request you all to join for tomorrow's session sharply at 9:50 am and once again i thank all the speakers of today for presenting their uh, talks thank you thank you